Section 20 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 5. Part 5. From the Prater I drove direct to my father's. The communication which I had to make to him would, I foresaw, give rise to unpleasant discussions. Still, I wanted to get over these inevitable unpleasantnesses as quickly as possible, and I preferred to face them at once under the first impression of the happiness I had just won. My father, who was a late riser, was still sitting over his breakfast with the morning papers when I ran into his study. Aunt Mary was present also, and likewise busy, over the paper. On my rather hasty entrance, my father looked up in surprise from the presser, and Aunt Mary laid down the Fremden blot. "'Martha, so early, and in riding dress! What does that mean?' I embraced them both, and then said, as I threw myself into an armchair, "'It means that I am come from a ride in the Prater, where something has taken place which I wanted to tell you about without delay, so I did not even take the time to drive home and change my dress.' "'And what is this thing so important and so pressing?' asked my father, lighting a cigar. "'Tell us. We are all anxiety.' "'Should I beat about the bush? Should I make introductions and preparations? "'No. Better leap in head over heels, as people leap from a springboard into the water. "'I have engaged myself.' "'Aunt Mary flung her hands over her head, and my father wrinkled his brow.' "'I hope, however, not,' he began, but I did not let him finish. "'Engaged myself to a man whom I love from my heart and reverence, and of whom I believe that he will make me completely happy, Baron Fried von Tilling.' My father jumped up. "'What do you say, after all I said to you yesterday?' Aunt Mary shook her head. "'I would sooner have heard a different name,' she said. In the first place, Baron Tilling is not a match for you. He cannot have anything. And in the second, his principles and his views seem to me... His principles and his views coincide entirely with mine. And as to looking for a match, as it is called, I am not disposed to do so. Father, dearest father of mine, do not look so cruelly at me. Do not spoil the great happiness which I feel at this moment. My good, dear, beloved papa. Well, but, my child, he replied in a somewhat softened tone, for a little coaxing used always to disarm him, it is nothing but your happiness which I have in view. I could not feel happy with any soldier who is not a soldier from his heart and soul. But really, you have not to marry Tilling, remarked Aunt Mary, in a very judicious way. The soldiership is the least matter in question, she added, but I could not be happy with a man who speaks in a tone of such little reverence of the God of the Bible as the other day. Allow me, dearest Aunt Mary, to call your attention to the fact that you have also not to marry Tilling. Well, what a man chooses is a heaven to him, said my father with a sigh, sitting down again. Tilling will quit the service, I suppose? We have not mentioned the subject as yet. I own I should prefer it, but I fear he will not do so. To think, sighed Aunt Mary, that you should have refused a prince, and now, instead of raising yourself, you will come down in the social scale. How unkind you are, both of you, and yet you say you love me. Here I come to you, the first time since poor Arno's death, with the news that I feel perfectly happy, and instead of being glad of it, you try to embitter it with all kinds of matters, militarism, Jehovah, the social scale. Still, after half an hour or so, I had succeeded somehow or other in talking the old folks around. After the conversation he had held with me the day before, I had expected my father's opposition to be much more violent. Possibly, if I had only spoken of projects and inclinations, he would have still striven hard to quench such projects and inclinations, but in presence of the fate accompli, he saw that resistance 
could not be of any further use. Or, possibly, it was the effect of the overflowing feeling of bliss which must have been sparkling in my eyes and quivering in my voice, which chased away his annoyance, and in which he was obliged against his will to take a sympathizing part. In fine, when I stood up to go, he pressed my cheek with a hearty kiss, and made me a promise that he would come to my house the same evening, and there salute his future son-in-law in that capacity. How the rest of the day and the evening passed, I am sorry to find not described in the Red Book. The details have escaped my recollections after so long a time. I only know they were delightful hours. At tea I had the whole family circle assembled around me, and I presented my freed von Tilling to them as my future husband. Rosa and Lily were delighted. Conrad Althaus cried, Bravo, Martha, and now, Lily, you take a lesson. My father had either overcome his old antipathy, or he managed to conceal it for my sake, and Aunt Mary was softened and touched. Marriages are made in heaven, she said, and every one's lot is according to his will. You will be happy if you have God's blessing, and I will pray continually that you may have it. The new papa was presented to son Rudolf, too, and it was to me a moment of peculiar delight and joyful anticipation when the dear man took up my dear child in his arms, kissed him warmly, and said, of you, little fellow, we too will make a perfect man. In the course of the evening, my father put his idea about quitting the service into words. You will give up your profession, Tilling, I suppose, as you are already not in love with war. Tilling threw his head back with a gesture of surprise. Give up my profession? Why, I have no other and a man need not be in love with war to perform his military duty any more than— Yes, yes, my father interposed. That is what you said the other day, any more than a fireman need be an admirer of conflagrations. I could bring forward more instances. No more than a physician need love cancer or typhus, or a judge be an especial admirer of burglaries. But to give up my way of life— what motive is there for that? The motive, said Aunt Mary, would be to spare your wife the life of a garrison town, and to spare her anxiety in case of a war breaking out, though such anxiety is to be sure nonsense, for if it is decreed to any one to live to be old, he lives so, in spite of all dangers. The reasons you have named would no doubt be weighty, to keep the lady who is to be my wife from all the unpleasantnesses of life as far as possible will certainly be my most earnest endeavour, but the unpleasantness of having a husband who would be without any profession or business would, I am sure, be even greater than those of garrison life, and the danger that my retirement might be charged against me by any one as laziness or cowardice would be even more terrible than those of a campaign." The idea really never occurred to me for a moment, and I hope not to you either, Martha. But suppose I made a condition of it? You would not do so, for otherwise I should have to renounce the height of bliss. You are rich. I have nothing except my military standing and the outlook to a higher rank in the future, and that is the possession I will not give up. It would be against all dignity, against my ideas of honour." Bravo, my son, now I am reconciled. It would be a sin and an outrage against your profession. You have not much farther to go to be colonel, and will certainly rise to general's rank, may at last become commandant of a fortress, governor, or minister of war. That gives your wife also a desirable position. I remained quite silent. The prospect of being a commandant's lady had no charms for me. It would have better suited me to have spent my life with the man of my choice in retirement in the country. But still, the resolution he had just expressed was dear to me, for it protected him from any stain of the suspicion which my father nourished against him, and which would certainly have clung to him in the eyes of the world. Yes, quite reconciled, my father went on, and rightly too, for I believed it was chiefly for that purpose— 
Now, now, you need not look in such a rage, I mean, partly, for the purpose of withdrawing into private life, and that would have been very unfair of you. Unfair, too, towards my Martha, for she is the child of a soldier, the widow of a soldier, and I don't believe that she could love a man in civilian's costume for a continuance. Tilling was now obliged to smile. He threw me a look which said plainly, I know you better, and answered aloud, I think so too, she really only fell in love with my uniform. End of section 20 Section number 21 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glenn Turner, Menifee, California. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter number 6, part 1. Marriage and Visit to Berlin Lady Cornelia von Tessov and her son A Wedding Tour Life in Garrison at Olmutz Christmas at Vienna Rumors of War A New Year's Party Back at Olmutz War Imminent Outbreak of the Schleswig-Holstein War History of the Quarrel in September of this year, our marriage took place. My bridegroom had got two months' leave for the wedding tour. Our first stage was Berlin. I had expressed a wish to lay a wreath on the grave of Frederick's mother and begin our tour with that pilgrimage. We stopped eight days in the Prussian capital. Frederick introduced me to his relatives who were living there, and all seemed to me the most amiable people in the world. And really, everything we met was pleasant and beautiful, wearing as we did those rose-colored glasses through which one looks at the outside world during the honeymoon. Besides, the newly married pair were greeted on all sides with cheerful and kindly politeness. Everyone seemed to find it a duty to strew new roses on a path already so sunny. What pleased me particularly in North Germany was the dialect not only because it was marked by my husband's accent, one of his qualities which had excited my love at first, but also because, in comparison with the way of speaking used in Austria, it seemed to announce a higher level of education, or rather did not seem, but was really its result. Grammatical solecisms such as deform the common speech of the best circles in Vienna do not occur in good society at Berlin. The Prussian substitution of the accusative for the dative, give mich einen Federhut, is confined to the lower classes, while in Vienna the ordinary confusions of cases such as on der, mit die Kinder, are heard commonly enough in the best drawing rooms. We may for all that call our way of speaking kindly, and get foreigners to take it as being so but it shows some inferiority nevertheless. If one measures human worth by the scale of education, and what more correct standard can one have, then the North German is a little bit more of a man than the South German, an assertion that would sound very arrogant in the mouth of a Prussian, and may seem very unpatriotic from the pen of an Austrian authoress, but how seldom is there any outspoken truth which does not give offense somewhere or somehow. Our first visit in Berlin after the churchyard was to the sister of the deceased. From the amiability of the intellectual accomplishments of this lady, I could infer how amiable and accomplished his mother must have been if she was like Frau Cornelia V. Tussov. The latter was the widow of a Prussian general, and had an only son who had just then become a lieutenant. I never met with a handsomer young man in my whole life than this Godfrey V. Tessov. It was touching to see the affection between mother and son, 
and in this also Frau Cormelia seemed to have a resemblance to her deceased sister. When I saw the pride which she visibly had in Godfrey, and the tenderness with which he treated his mother, I was already delighting myself with imagining the time when my son Rudolph should be grown up. One thing only I could not understand, and this I expressed to my husband thus. How can a mother allow her only child, her treasure, to embrace so dangerous a profession as the army? My dear, there are simple reflections which no one ever makes, Frederick answered. Considerations which lie so near one that no one ever heeds them. Such a reflection is the danger of the military profession. People do not allow themselves to take that into consideration. It is thought a kind of impropriety or cowardice to allow that to weigh with one. And so it is assumed as a matter of course and inevitable that such danger must be survived, and indeed is always nearly survived by good luck. The percentages of killed are distributed over other people. And so the chance of being killed is not thought of. To be sure it exists, but so it does for everyone born into the world. And yet no one thinks about death. The mind can do a great deal to chase away troublesome thoughts. And lastly, what more pleasant and more respected position can a Prussian nobleman occupy than that of a cavalry officer? Aunt Cornelia appeared also pleased with me. Ah, she sighed on one occasion, how I wish that my poor sister could have lived to feel the joy of having such a daughter-in-law and seeing her Frederick so happy as he is now with you. It was always her warmest wish to see him married, but he demanded so much for marriage that it did not seem like it he would fall in love with me, Auntie. That is what the English call fishing for a compliment. I only wish my Godfrey could get such a prize. I have been long impatient to know the joy of being a grandmother. But I shall have to wait long for that. My son is only twenty-one. He may turn young ladies' heads, I said, break many hearts. That would not be like him. A better, more straightforward young man does not exist. One day he will make a wife very happy, as Frederick makes his. You cannot tell that quite yet, my dear. We must talk about that ten years hence. In the first few weeks, almost everyone is happy. Not that I express any doubt of my nephew or of you. I believe quite that your happiness will be lasting. This prophecy of Aunt Cornelia I wrote down in my diary and wrote underneath it, Did it come true? The answer to be written ten years hence. And then I left a line blank. How I filled up that line in the year 1873, well, that must not be set down in this place as yet. After leaving Berlin, we went to the German watering places. If my short tour in Italy with Arno were left out of account, and of this I had besides only a dreamy recollection, I had never been away from home. To make acquaintance in this way with new places, new people, new ways of life, put me into a most elevated state of mind. The world appeared to me to have become all at once so beautiful and thrice as interesting. If it had not been for my little Rudolph that I had left behind, I should have pressed Frederick. Let us travel about like this for years. We will visit the whole of Europe and then the other quarters of the globe. Let us enjoy this wandering life, this unfettered roving to and fro. Let us collect the treasures of new impressions and experiences everywhere that we come to. However strange may be the people or the country, we shall be sure, in virtue of our companionship, to bring a sufficient portion of home along with us. What would Frederick have answered to such a proposition? Probably that a man cannot make it his business to spend his life in a wedding tour, that his leave only lasted for two months, and many more such reasonable matters. We visited Baden-Baden, Hamburg, and Wiesbaden, everywhere the same cheerful, elegant way of living, everywhere so many interesting people from all the chief countries of the world. 
It was in intercourse with these foreigners that I first became aware that Frederick was a perfect master of the French and English languages, a thing which made him rise to a still higher place in my admiration. I was always discovering new qualities in him, gentleness, liveliness, the most quick feeling for everything beautiful. A voyage on the Rhine threw him into raptures, and in the theater or concert room, when the artist performed anything peculiarly excellent, his enjoyment shone out in his eyes. This made the Rhine and his castle seem to me doubly romantic. This redoubled my admiration of the performances of celebrated musicians. These two months passed over only too swiftly. Frederick applied for an extension of his leave, but it was decided against him. It was my first unpleasant moment since my marriage when this official paper arrived, which in curt style ordered our return home. And men call that freedom, I cried, throwing the Fendum document down on the table. Tilling smiled. Oh, I never looked on myself as free in the least, my mistress, he replied. If I were your mistress, I could find it in my heart to command you to bid adieu to military service and live only to serve me in the future. On this question we had agreed. Yes, I know. I'm obliged to submit. But that proves that you are not my slave. And at bottom, I feel that that is right, my dear proud husband. End of section 21「Section 22 of Lay Down Your Arms」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 6, Part 2 On our return from our tour, we went to a small Moravian city, the fortress of Olmutz, where Frederick's regiment lay in garrison. There was no opportunity for social intercourse in the neighborhood, so we two lived in complete retirement, with the exception of the hours given up to duty. He as lieutenant colonel with his dragoons, I as a mother with my Rudolph. We gave ourselves up to each other only, the necessary ceremonial calls and return calls had been exchanged with the ladies of the regiment, but I could not lend myself to any intimate acquaintance. It did not amuse me in the least to go to afternoon tea parties and hear stories about servant maids and the gossip of the town, and Frederick held off quite as far from the gambling parties of the colonel and the drinking bouts of the officers. We had something better to do. The world in which we moved, when we sat in the evening by the boiling tea kettle, was worlds away from the world of Ulamot's society. Worlds away, often in a literal sense, for some of the favorite excursions of our spirit were directed towards the firmament. For we often read together scientific works and instructed ourselves in the wonders of the formation of the world. In this way we penetrated into the depths of the world's center in the heights of the heavenly spaces. In this way we explored the secrets of the infinite minuteness revealed by the microscope and the infinite distances of the telescope, and by how much the wider the universe expanded before our gaze, by so much did the affairs of the Olmutz circle shrink into narrower dimensions. Our readings did not confine themselves to the natural sciences, but embraced many other branches of inquiry and thought. Thus I took up, among other things, my favorite buckle, for the third time, to make Frederick acquainted with that author, whom he admired quite as much as I did, and at the same time we did not neglect the poets or novelists, and so our evening readings together became real feasts of the mind, while the rest of our existence, besides, was a continual feast of the heart. Every day we became more fond of each other. As passion cooled in its flame, Affection increased in its intimacy and respect in its steadfastness. The relations between Frederick and Rudolf were a source of delight to me. The two were the best friends in the world, and to see them playing together was charming. Frederick was, if anything, the more childish of the two. Of course, I joined in the game at once, 
and all the nonsense that we act it and said at these times we hoped the wise and learned men would forgive us whose works we read when rudolph had been put to bed frederick it is true maintained that apart from him he was not very fond of children but in the first place the little boy was the son of his martha and in the next he was really such a dear good little fellow and suited his stepfather so wonderfully we often laid plans for the boy's future a soldier no he should have no aptitude for it since in our scheme of education there would be no drilling him into a love for military glory a diplomatist perhaps but most likely a country gentleman as heir presently to the Dotsky estate which must come to him on the death of arno's uncle now sixty-six years old he would have sufficient business in managing his possessions properly then he might take his little bride beatrix to himself and live happily we ourselves were so happy that he would gladly have seen all the world ay and future generations too assured of the treasures of all life's joys yet we did not shut our eyes to the misery in which the greater part of mankind was groaning and in which for some generations at any rate they must continue to groan poverty ignorance want of freedom exposed to so many dangers and ills and among these ills the most dreadful of all war ah could one contribute anything towards warding it off this wish often sprang with groans from our hearts but the contemplation of the prevailing circumstances and views was enough to discourage us and make us feel that it was impossible alas the beautiful dream that for every one it might be well with them and they might live long upon the earth could not be fulfilled at least not at present the pessimist theory however that life itself is an evil that it would have been better for every one if he had never been born that was radically refuted by our own lot at christmas we undertook an excursion to vienna in order to spend the holidays in the circle of my family my father was now fully reconciled to frederick the fact that the latter had not quitted the army had chased away his former doubts and suspicions that i had made a bad match remained indeed the conviction both of my father and aunt mary but on the other hand they could not help perceiving the fact that my husband made me very happy and then they reckoned in his favor rosa and lily were sorry that they would have to go into the world next carnival not under my supervision but the much more severe one of their aunt conrad althus was still as before a constant visitor at the house and i could see i thought that he had made progress in lily's graces christmas eve turned out very gay a great christmas tree was lighted up and all kinds of presents were exchanged between one and the other the king of the feast and the one who had the most presents was of course my son rudolph but all the others were thought of amongst the rest frederick got one from me at the sight of which he could not repress a cry of joy it was a silver letterweight in the form of a stork in its bill it held a slipper paper on which in my writing were the words i am bringing you something in the summer of eighteen sixty four frederick embraced me warmly if the others had not been there he would certainly have waltzed round the room with me End of section twenty two Section 23 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 6, Part 3. On Boxing Day, the whole family gathered together again at dinner at my father's. There were no strangers except the Right Honorable, to be sure, and Dr. Bresser. As we were sitting at table in the familiar dining room, I could not help having a lively remembrance of that evening when we two first plainly recognized our love. Dr. Bresser had the same thought. Have you forgotten the game of piquet which I was playing with your father while you chatted over the fire with Baron Tilling? He asked me. I seemed, it is true, quite absorbed in my play, but nevertheless I had my ear cocked in your direction and heard from the sound of the voices, for I could not catch the words, something which awoke in me the conviction, those two will come together. And now that I observe you together, a new conviction arises in me. 
those two are and will remain happy together. I admire your penetration, Doctor. Yes, we are happy. Shall we remain so? That unfortunately depends not on ourselves, but on fate. Over every happiness there hangs a danger, and the more heartfelt is the former, so much the more terrible the latter. What have you to fear? Death. Ah, yes, that did not occur to me. As a physician, it is true, I have frequent opportunities of meeting the gentleman, but I do not think of him. And indeed, for young and healthy people, like the happy pair we are speaking of, he lies so far in the distance. What is a soldier better for youth and health? Chase away such ideas, dear Baroness. There is really no war in prospect. Is it not true, Your Excellency, he said, turning to the minister, that at present the dark point so often spoken of is not visible? Point is far too little to say, he replied. It is rather a black, heavy cloud. I trembled to my heart's core. What? I cried out sharply. What do you mean? Denmark is going altogether too far. Oh, Denmark? I said, much relieved. Then the cloud is not threatening us. It is indeed to me a sad thing, under any circumstances, to hear that there is to be fighting anywhere. But if it is to be the Danes and not the Austrians, I feel pity indeed, but no fear. Well, you have no need for fear either, my father broke in hastily, even if Austria were to protect her own interests. If we have to defend the rights of Schleswig holstein against the supremacy of Denmark, we're not risking anything in doing so. There is no question of any Austrian territory, the loss of which might be involved in an unsuccessful campaign. Do you think then, father, that if our troops should have to march out, I should be thinking of such things as Austrian territory, Schleswig holsteins rights, or Danish supremacy? I should see one thing only, the danger of our dear ones. And that would remain just as great whether the war were waged for one cause or another. My dear child, the fate of individuals does not come into consideration in cases where the events of the world's history are being decided. If a war breaks out, the question whether one or another will fall in it or not is silenced in the presence of the one mighty question whether one's own country will gain or lose in it. And as I said, if we fight with the Danes, we have nothing to lose in the war and may improve our power and position in the German Bund. I am always dreaming that the Habsburgs may yet one day get back the dignity of German emperor, which is their birthright. It would indeed be only proper. We are the most considerable state in the Bund. The hedge money is secured to us, but that is not enough. I should welcome the war with Denmark as a very happy event, not only to wipe out the stain of 59, but also so to improve our position in the German Bund that we should get a rich compensation for the loss of Lombardy. And, who knows? gain in power to such an extent that the reconquest of that province will be an easy task. I looked across to Frederick. He had taken no part in the conversation, but had engaged in a lively laughing prattle with Lily. A stab of pain shot through my soul, a pain which united into one twenty different fancies. War, and he, my all, would have to go, would be crippled, shot dead, the child in my bosom, whose coming he had greeted with such joy yesterday, would be born into the world an orphan. All destroyed, all destroyed, our happiness, yet scarcely full-blown, but bearing the promise of such rich fruit. This danger in the one scale, and in the other, Austria's consideration in the German Bund, the liberation of Schleswig holstein fresh laurels in the army's crown of glory, i.e., a lot of phrases for school themes and army proclamations, and even that only dubious, for defeat is always just as possible as victory. And this supposed benefit to the country is to be set against not one individual suffering, mine, but thousands and thousands of individuals in our own and in the enemy's country must be exposed to the same pain as was now quivering through me. Oh, could this not be prevented? Could it not be warded off? If all were to unite all learned, good, and just men to avert the threatened evil. But tell me, I said aloud, turning to the minister, are affairs really in so bad a condition? You ministers and diplomatists, have you no means of hindering this conflict? Do you know of no way of preventing it from breaking out? Do you think then, Baroness, that it is our office to maintain perpetual peace? That would, to be sure, be a grand mission, only not practicable. We exist only to watch over the interests of our respective states and dynasties, to work against anything that may threaten the diminution of their power, and strive to conquer for them every supremacy possible. Jealousy to guard the honor of the country, to avenge any insult cast on it. In short, I interrupted, to act on the principle of war, 
to do the enemy, i.e., every other state, all the harm possible, and if a dispute begins, to persist as long as possible in asserting that you are in the right, even if you see you are in the wrong. A. Eh? To be sure, till the patience of the two disputants gives way, and they have to begin hacking away at each other. It is horrible. But that is the only way out. How else can a dispute between nations be decided? How then are trials between civilized individuals decided? By the tribunals, but nations have no such over them. No more have savages, said Dr. Bresser, coming to my help. Ergo, nations in their intercourse with each other are still uncivilized, and it will take a good long time yet before we come to the point of establishing an international tribunal of arbitration. We shall never get to that, said my father. There are things which can only be fought out and cannot be settled by law. Even if one chose to try to establish such an arbitration court, the stronger governments would as little submit to it as two men of honor, one of whom has been assaulted, would carry their difference into a court of law. They simply send their seconds and fight to set themselves right. But the duel is a barbarous, uncivilized custom. You won't alter it, doctor. Still, your excellency, I would not defend it. What say you then, Frederick, said my father, turning to his son-in-law? Is your opinion that a man who has received a slap on the face should take the matter before a court of law and get five florins damages? I should not do so. You would challenge the man who insulted you? Of course. Aha, doctor, aha, Martha, said my father in triumph. Do you hear? Even Tilling, who is no friend of war, submits to and is a friend of dueling. A friend? I have never said so. I only said that in a given case, I would, as a matter of course, have recourse to the duel, as indeed I have actually done once or twice. Just as, equally as a matter of course, I have several times taken part in a war, and will do so again on the next occasion. I guide myself by the rules of honor, but I by no means imply thereby that those rules, as they now exist among us, correspond to my own moral ideal. By degrees, as this ideal gains the sovereignty, the conception of honor will also experience a change. Some day, an insult one may have experienced, and which is unprovoked, will redoubt as a disgrace, not on the receiver, but on the savage inflictor. And when this is the case, self-revenge in matters of honor also will fall as much out of use as in civilized society, it has become practically out of the question to write oneself in other matters. Till that time comes, well, we shall have some time to wait for that, my father broke in, as long as there are persons of quality anywhere. But that, too, may not perhaps be forever, hinted the doctor. Holloa, you would not get rid of rank, Mr. Radical, cried my father. Well, I would, a feudal rank. The future has no need for nobility. So much the more need for noble men, said Frederick in confirmation. And this new race will put up with their slaps on the face? First of all, they will give none. And will not defend themselves if a neighboring state makes a hostile attack on them? There will be no attacks from neighboring states. No more than our country seats now are besieged by neighboring citizens, as the nobleman no longer needs armed squires to defend his castle. So the state of the future will dispense with its armed hosts? What will become, then, of you, lieutenant colonels? What has become of the squires? And so the old dispute began again, and was prolonged for some time longer. I hung with delight on Frederick's lips. It did me more good than I can say to see the cause of noble humanity so firmly and so confidently defended and in spirit I applied to himself the name he had just used, Nobleman. End of section 23. Section 24 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit www. Dot .librivox .org. recording by Tracy Ann lay down your arms by Bertha von Suttner translated by Timothy Holmes chapter 6 part 4 we stayed a fortnight longer in vienna but it was by no means a pleasant holiday to me this fatal prospect of war which now filled all newspapers and all conversations robbed me of all pleasure in my life as often as I thought of any of the things of which my happiness was made up, and especially my possession of a husband, who was becoming daily dearer to me, so often was I reminded also of the uncertainty, of the imminent danger which hung over all my happiness, in view of the war which was looming in sight, 
And so I could not, as the saying is, feel myself comfortable. Of the accidents of sickness and death, conflagrations, inundations, in short, all the menaces of nature and the elements, there are sufficient, but one has habituated oneself not to think about them, and one lives in a certain sense of security in spite of these dangers. But how is it that men have created for themselves other dangers arbitrarily devised by themselves, and thus, of their own will and in pure wantonness, thrown into artificial eruption the volcanic soil on which the happiness of this life is founded? It is true that people have also accustomed themselves to think of war, too, as a natural phenomenon, and to speak of it as eluding calculation in the same category with the earthquake or drought, and therefore to think of it as little as possible. But I could no longer bring myself to this way of looking at it. The question, of which Frederick had once spoken, must it then be so? I had often answered with a negative in the case of war. And at this time, instead of resignation, I felt pain and vexation. I should have liked to shout out to them all, do not do it, do not do it. This business of Schleswig-Holstein and the Danish constitution, what did it matter to us? Whether the protocol prince abolished the fundamental law of November 13th, 1863, or confirmed it, what did it matter to us? Yet all the journals and speeches at that time were full of discussions on this matter, as if it were the most important, most decisive, most universally comprehensive question in the world, so that in comparison with it, the query, are our husbands and sons to be shot dead, ought not even to be considered. Only at intervals could I myself, for a moment, feel anyhow reconciled to this state of things. For example, when the conception of duty came directly before my soul, it was true, no doubt, we belonged to the German Bund, and in common with our brothers of Germany, combined in that society, we were bound to fight for the rights of German brothers who were being oppressed. The principle of nationality was no doubt a thing that with elemental force demanded its field of action, and therefore, from this point of view, the thing must be. By sticking to this idea, the painful indignation of my soul subsided a little. Had I been able to foresee how, two years later, the whole of this German band of brothers would be broken up by the bitterest enmity, that then the hatred of Prussia would have become far more burning in Austria than the hatred of Denmark now was, I should have recognized, even so early, what I learned to know later on, that the motives which are adduced in order to justify hostilities are nothing but phrases, phrases and pretexts. New Year's Eve we again spent in my father's house. As it struck twelve, he raised his glass. May the campaign which is before us in this new year be a glorious one for our arms, he said solemnly. And at these words, I put my glass, which I had just lifted up, down on the table again. And, he concluded, may our dear ones be spared to us. In that, I concurred. Why did you not drink to the first half of my toast, Martha? Because I can have no wish about a campaign, except that it may never occur. When we had got back into the hotel and into our bedroom, I threw myself on Frederick's neck. My own one, Frederick, Frederick. What is the matter with you, Martha? You are weeping, and today, on New Year's night? Why then salute the New Year with tears? Are you not happy? Have I given you any offense? You? Oh, no, no. You make me only too happy, much too happy, and that makes me anxious. Superstitious, Martha? Do you then conjure up for yourself envious gods? who destroy men's happiness when it is too great? Not gods. It is senseless men who call misery down on themselves. You are hinting at this possible war, but it is certainly not settled as yet. Why then this premature grief? Who knows whether it will come to blows? And who knows, if so, whether I shall be called out? Come here, my darling, and let us sit down. 
and he drew me to the sofa by his side. Do not spend your tears on a bare possibility. Even the possibility is terrible to me. If it were a certainty, Frederick, I should not be crying so softly and quietly on your shoulder. I should have to shriek and wail out loud. But the possibility, nay, the probability, that in the year which is opening, you may be torn from my arms by a marching order, that is quite enough to transport me with anxiety and grief. Bethink you, Martha. You are yourself going to meet a peril, as this Christmas box of yours so charmingly informed me. And yet we too do not think of the cruel possibility which threatens every woman in childbed about as much as every man on the battlefield. Let us enjoy our life and not think of the death which is impending over the heads of all of us. You are talking just like Aunt Mary, dearest, as if our lot depended on providence and not on the thoughtlessness, cruelty, excesses, and follies of our fellow men. Wherein lies the inevitable necessity of this war with Denmark? It has not yet broken out, and there may still, I know, I know, accidents may still happen to avert the evil. But it is not accident, not political intrigues and humors, which ought to decide such questions of destiny, but the firm, righteous will of mankind. But what is the good of my ought or ought not? I cannot alter the order of things. I can only complain of it. But do help me so far, Frederick. Do not try to console me with hollow conventional evasions. You do not believe in them yourself. You yourself are shuddering with noble repugnance. The only consolation I find is in thinking that you condemn and bewail, as I do, what will make me and numberless others so unhappy. Yes, my dear, if this fatality should come to pass, then I will say you are right. Then I will not hide from you the shuddering and the hate which the national slaughter ordained on us awakes in me. But today, let us still enjoy our life. We surely have each other. Nothing separates us. There is not the slightest bar between our souls. Let us enjoy this happiness as long as we have it. Enjoy it to the full. Let us not think of the threatened destruction of it. No joy, assuredly, can last forever. In a hundred years it will be all the same, whether our life had been long or short. The number of beautiful days is not the question, but the degree of their beauty. Let the future bring what it pleases, my dearly loved wife. Our present is so beautiful, so very beautiful, that I cannot now feel anything but a blessed delight. As he said this, he threw his arm around me and kissed my head, which rested on his breast. And then the threatening future disappeared for me also, and I too let myself sink into the sweet transport of the moment. End of section 24. Recording by Tracy Ann. Section 25 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 6, Part 5. On 10th of January, we returned to Olmütz. No one any longer doubted about the outbreak of war. I had heard a few individuals in Vienna hope that the Schleswig-Holstein dispute could even yet be capable of diplomatic settlement. But in the military circles of our garrison town, all possibility of peace was held to be out of the question. Among the officers and the wives, there prevailed an excited, but on the whole, joyfully excited temper. Opportunities for distinction and advancement were in prospect, for the satisfaction of the love of adventure in one, the ambition of another, the first for promotion of a third. This is a famous war which is in prospect, said the colonel, to whose house, with several other officers and their wives, we were invited to dinner. A famous war, and one that must be immensely popular. 
no danger to our territory and even the population of our country will suffer no diminution since the scene of war lies on foreign soil what inspires me in the matter said a young first lieutenant is the noble motive to defend the rights of our brethren under oppression the fact that the prussians are marching with us or rather we with them assures us in the first place of victory and in the next place it will bind still closer the bonds of nationality the national idea i had rather you would not talk about that interposed the colonel rather sternly that humbug does not sit well on an austrian it was that that raised up the italian war against us for it was on this hobby horse italy for the italians that louis napoleon kept always mounting and the whole principle especially unsuitable for austria bohemians hungarians germans croats where's the bond of nationality we know one principle only which unites us and that is the loyal love of our reigning family therefore what ought to put spirit into us when we take the field is not the circumstance that we are germans and have germans as allies but that we can render loyal service to our exhorted and beloved commander-in-chief the emperor's health i stood up to drink the toast a spark of animation even reached my heart inflaming it for a moment and filling it with a warmth that did me good that thousands should love one and the same cause one and the same person is a thing which produces a peculiar a thousandfold impulse of devotion and that is the feeling which swells the heart under the name of loyalty patriotism or esprit de corps it is in reality nothing but love and this has such a mighty working that the man regards the work of hatred ordained in its name even the most horrible work of the deadliest hatred war as the fulfillment of the duty of his love but this glow only lasted in my heart for one instant for a love stronger than that for any earthly fatherland or father of the country filled its depths the love of my husband his life was to me in all cases the dearest of my possessions and if it was to be the stake i could do nothing but abhor the game whether it was to be played for schleswig-holstein or japan the time which now followed i passed in unspeakable anxiety on sixteenth of january the powers of the bund addressed a demand to denmark calling on her to abrogate a certain law against which the convocation of estates and the nobles of holstein had invoked the protection of the bund and to do this in twenty-four hours denmark refused who would consent to be commanded in that fashion this refusal had been foreseen of course for austrian and prussian troops stood ready posted on the frontier and on first of february they crossed the eider so the bloody die was cast again the game had begun this gave occasion to my father to send us a letter of congratulation we choice my children he wrote now we have at length an opportunity to repair the losses we got in fifty nine by inflicting losses on the danes when we have come back from the north as conquerors we shall be able to turn our faces southwards again the prussians will remain our constant allies and in that case these shabby italians and the intriguing louis napoleon cannot again stand up against us frederick's regiment to the great disappointment of the colonel and the corps of officers was not detached to the frontier this fact brought us a paternal letter of condolence i am heartily sorry that tilling has the ill luck to be serving in just one of the regiments which are not called on to open the campaign which has such glorious prospects but 
there remains always the possibility that he will be marked out to follow in support. Martha, indeed, will look on the best side of the business and be glad that the fear for her beloved husband is spared her. And Frederick also is confessedly no friend of war, but I think he is only against it in principle. That is to say, he would rather, on grounds of so-called humanity, that it should never come to fighting, but when it has so come, then he would, I know, rather have a part in it, for then I know his manly love of battle would awake. In truth, it ought to be the whole army that should always be sent to meet the foe. At such a time, to be forced to stay at home is surely something altogether too hard on a soldier. Does it strike you as hard, my Frederick, to remain with me? I asked after reading the letter. He pressed me to his heart. The damp reply contented me. But what was the good of it? My peace was gone. The order to march might come any day. If the unhappy war could only be brought to an end quickly, with the greatest eagerness did I read in the newspapers the news from the seat of war, and warmly did I wish that the allies might win speedy and decisive victories. I confess that the wish had no patriotism at all in it. I should indeed have preferred that the victory should be on our side, but what I hoped from it was the termination of the war before my all on earth was out there. And then only in the second degree the triumph of my countrymen and quite in the last the sea-surrounded patch of country. Whether, however, Schleswig was to belong to Denmark or no, what in the world could that matter to me? And finally, what matter could it make to the Danes and Schleswig-Holsteiners themselves? Could not then the true nations themselves see that it was only the rulers who were quarreling about the possession of territory and power, and that in the present case, for example, the question was not the good or the suffering, but the wishes of the so-called Prince Protocol and of the Augustenburgs. If a number of dogs are fighting over some bones, it is still only the dogs themselves who tear each other. But in the history of nations, it is chiefly the poor silly bones themselves that rush at each other and knock each other to pieces on the two sides in fighting for the rights of the combatants who covet them. Lion warns me, or Tausa has a claim on me. I protest against Carol's fangs, or I reckon it an honor to be swallowed by Growler, cried the bones. Denmark up to the Eider, shouted the Danish patriots. We will have Frederick of Augustenburg for our duke, shouted the loyalists of Holstein. The articles in our papers and the talk of our quittnungs were all of course permeated by the principle that the cause for which we had entered into the war was the right one, the only one which was historically developed, the only one necessary for the maintenance of the balance of power in Europe. And of course, the opposite principle was maintained with equal emphasis in the leading articles and in the political speeches in Copenhagen. Why not on both sides weigh the rival claims in order to come to an understanding? And, if this should fail, make a third power arbitrator? Why go on, always shouting on both sides, I, I am in the right, and even shouting it out against one's own conviction till one has shouted oneself hoarse and finishes by leaving the decision to force? Is not that savagery? And even should the third power mix in the strife, it also does so, not with a balancing of rights or a judicial sentence, but equally, with downright blows. And that is what people call foreign politics. Foreign and domestic savagery it is, statesmen like Tom Fullery, international barbarism, 
End of section 25. Section 26 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner, translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 6, Part 6. It is true that I did not at the time look at what was going on in this light with such certainty as this. It was only for a few moments that doubts of this sort woke up in me, and then I took all possible pains to chase them away. I attempted to persuade myself that the mysterious thing called reasons of state, a thing elevated above all private reason, and particularly my own poor faculties, was a principle on which the life of states depends, and I began a zealous study of the history of Shelswig Holstein in order to arrive at a conception of the historic rights which it was the object of the present proceedings to maintain. And then I discovered that the strip of land in dispute had, as early as the year 1027, been ceded to Denmark. So in reality, the Danes are in the right. They are the legitimate kings of the country. But then, 200 years later, the district was made over to a younger branch of the royal house, and then ranked rather as a fief of the Danish crown. In 1326, Shelswig was given over to Count Gerard of Holstein, and the constitution of Waldemar provides that, it should never again be so far united with Denmark that there should be but one lord. Oh, then the right is still on the side of the Allies. We are fighting for the constitution of Waldemar. That is quite correct, for what is the use of these securities on paper if they are not to be upheld? In the year 1448, the constitution of Waldemar was again confirmed by King Christian I. So there can be no doubt that there must and shall never again be one lord. What is the protocol prince to do in the matter? Twelve years later, the ruler of Shelswig dies without issue, and the estates of the country meet at Ripon. It would be well if we always knew with such exactness when and where the estates met. Well, it was in 1460 at Ripon. And they proclaim the king of Denmark, Duke of Shelswig, in return for which he promises them that the countries shall remain together forever, undivided. This makes me again a little confused. The only point to hold by is that they shall remain together forever. But the confusion goes on, constantly increasing, as this historical study takes a wider circuit. For now, in spite of the formula, forever undivided, the word forever plays an exquisite part generally in political business, there commences an everlasting cutting up and division of the territory amongst the king's sons and a reunion of these under a seceding king, and the founding of new families, Holstein Gottorp and Shelswig Sonderberg, which with reciprocal shuffling and sessions of their shares again separate themselves into families of sonderberg Augustenburg, back glucksburg sonderberg glucksburg holstein Gluckstadt. In short, I no longer knew where I was. But there is more to come. Perhaps the historical claim for which the sons of our country have to bleed today may not have been established till later. Christian IV mixed himself up in the Thirty Years' War, and the imperialists and Swedes invaded the duchies. Now was made, at Copenhagen, 1658, another treaty, by which the lordship over the Shelswick portion was secured to the house of Holstein Gottorp, and so at last we have got done with the Danish feudal lordship. Done with it forever, thank God. Now I find myself again all right. But what happened by the patent of 22nd August, 1721? Simply this, the Gottorp's dominion of Shelswick was incorporated into the kingdom of Denmark. In January 1773, Holstein also was ceded to the Royal House of Denmark, the whole ranked now as a Danish province. That changes the affair. The Danes are in the right. Yet not entirely so. The Congress of Vienna in 1815 declares Holstein to be a part of the German Bund. This, however, vexes the Danes. They invent the cry, Denmark up to the Eider, and struggle for the complete possession of Shelswig, called by them South Jutland against which the hereditary right of Augustenburg was employed as a watchword and used in German national proclamations. In the year 1846, King Christian writes a public letter in which he proposes the integrity of the entire state as his object, and against this the German countries protest. Two years later, the complete union is announced from the throne, no longer as an object, but as a fait accompli, and then the uprising occurs in the German countries. And now the fighting begins. At first, the Danes gain the victory in one fight, next the Shelswig Holsteiners in a second. Then the German Bund intervenes. The Prussians occupy the heights of Dupel, but that does not terminate the strife. 
Prussia and Denmark make peace. Schleswig Holstein has now to fight the Danes single handed and is struck down at Eidstedt. The Bund now calls on the revolters to discontinue the war, which they proceed to do. Austrian troops take possession of Holstein, and the two duchies are separated. So what has become of the paper stipulation to be forever united? Still, the situation is not made completely secure. Now I find a protocol of London, 8th May, 1852. It is a good thing that we always know so exactly the date when these fragile treaties are made, which secures the secession of Schleswig to Prince Christian of Glucksburg. Secures is good. And now I know, at any rate, the origin of the name Protocol Prince. In the year 1854, after each duchy had received a constitution of its own, both were Danized. But in 1858, the Danization of Holstein had to be revoked again. And now this historical sketch is coming quite close to the present time, and yet it is not so clear to me to whom the two countries rightly belong, or what was the precise cause of the outbreak of the present war. On 18th November, 1858, the famous Fundamental Law for the Mutual Relations between Denmark and Schleswig was passed by the Reichsrath. Two days afterwards, the king died. With him again was extinguished a family, that of Holstein Gluckstadt, and when the successor of the monarch presented himself on the scene in reliance on the two-days-old law, Frederick of Augustenburg, a family I had nearly forgotten, raised his claim, and together with his nobility turned for support to the German Bund. The latter at once occupied Holstein with Saxon and Hanoverian troops and proclaimed Augustenburg Duke. Why? But Prussia and Austria were not of accord in this proceeding. Why? That I do not to this day understand. It is said the London Protocol had to be respected. Why? Are these protocols about things which concern us absolutely nothing so exceedingly to be respected that we must defend them at the price of the blood of our own sons? If so, there must lie in the background some mysterious reason of state for it. It must be firmly held as a dogma that what the gentlemen round the green table of diplomacy may decide is the highest wisdom, and has for its aim the greatest possible advance of the power of one's country. The London Protocol of 8th May, 1852, had to be maintained intact, but the Fundamental Law of Copenhagen of 13th January, 1863, had to be abolished, and that within 24 hours. On that hung Austria's honor and welfare. The dogma was a little hard to believe, but in political matters, almost more willingly than in religious, the masses allow themselves to be led by the principle of the quia absurdum. They have renounced beforehand the attempt to reason and understand. When the sword is once drawn, nothing more is necessary than to shout hurrah and press hotly on to victory. Besides that, all that is necessary is to invoke the blessings of heaven on the war. For so much is certain that it must be the business of the Almighty to see that the protocol of the 8th May is maintained and the law of 5th November repealed. He must conduct the matter so that the precise number of men bleed to death and villages are set on fire that are necessary in order that the family of Glockstadt, or that of Augustenburg, should rule over a particular spot of earth. What a foolish world, still in leading strings, cruel, unthinking. Such was the result of my historical studies. End of section 26. Section 27 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica Hendra. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 7, Part 1. The Course of the Danish War. Suspension of Hostilities. War Renewed. My Husband Ordered Off, Just on the Eve of My Confinement. The Parting. My Confinement Occurs Simultaneously with My Husband's Departure. A Dead Child. The Mother in Deadly Peril. Frederick's Letters from the Seat of War. Cousin Godfrey and the alliance between Austria and Prussia, my recovery, anxiety and relapse, return of my husband. From the theatre of war came good tidings. The Allies won battle after battle. Immediately after the first combats, the Danes were forced to abandon the entire Dane work. Schleswig and Jutland, up to Limfjorn, were occupied by our troops, and the enemy only maintained himself in the lines at Dupel and at Alsen. 
I knew all this so accurately, because on the tables were again laid the maps, stuck about with pins, on which were marked the movements and positions of the troops, as each dispatch arrived. If we could now only take the lines at Dupel, or if we could even conquer Alsen, said the citizens of Olmunz, for no one is so fond of speaking of deeds of war with the we as those who were never present at them. Then we should be at the end of it. Now our Austrians are showing again what they can do. The brave Prussians, too, are fighting splendidly. Both together are, of course, invincible. The end will be that all Denmark will be overrun and will be annexed to the German Bund. A glorious, beneficent war. I, too, wished for nothing so anxiously as the storming of Dupel. The sooner, the better, for this action would at any rate be decisive, and put an end to the butchery. Put an end to it, I hoped, before Frederick's regiment got marching orders. Oh, this Damocles sword! Every day when I woke, the fear came on me that the news would be brought. We are to march! Frederick was calm about it. He did not wish it, but saw it coming. Accustom yourself, dear, to the thought of it, he said to me. Against inexorable necessity, no striving is of any avail. I do not believe that even if Dupel falls, the war will thereby terminate. The allied army which has been dispatched is far too small to force the Danes to a conclusion. We shall be obliged to send considerable reinforcements besides, and then my regiment will not be spared. In fact, this campaign had lasted more than two months, and yet no result. If the cruel game could have been settled in one fight like a duel, but no, if one battle is lost, another is offered, if one position has to be given up, another is taken, and so on till one or the other army is annihilated, or both are exhausted. At last, on 14th April, the lines of Dupel were stormed. The news was received with such a shout of joy as if the recovered paradise had lain behind these lines. People embraced each other in the streets. Don't you know? Dupel! Oh, our brave army! An unheard of exploit! Now let all join in thanking God. And there was singing of te deums in all the churches and among the military, choir masters, an industrious composition of the lines of Dupel march, storm of Dupel gallop, and so forth. My husband's comrades and their wives had, it is true, a drop of bitterness in their cup of joy, not to have been there, to have been obliged to miss such a triumph. What bad luck! This victory gave me one great joy, for immediately after it a peace conference assembled in London and occasioned a suspension of hostilities. What a recovery of free breath even that word, suspension of hostilities, caused! How the world would at last breathe again, thought I then for the first time, if on all hands could be heard, lay down your arms, down with them for ever. I put the words into my red book, but beside them I wrote despondingly in brackets, Utopia, that the London Congress would make an end of the Schleswig-Holstein War. I made no doubt at all. The Allies had won. The lines of Dupel were carried. These lines had played so great a part in recent times that their capture seemed to me to be finally decisive. How could Denmark hold out longer? The negotiations dragged on for an incredible length of time. This would have been torture to me if I had not, from the very beginning, had the conviction that their result must be peaceful. If the planipotangeries of great states, who therefore must be reasonable, well-meaning persons, unite together to attain so desirable an end as the conclusion of peace. How could it fail? So much the more horribly was I undeceived, when after debates continued for two months, the news came that the Congress had dissolved without accomplishing anything, and two days later came marching orders for Frederick. For preparations and for leave-taking he had twenty-four hours given him, and I was on the point of my confinement. In the heavy, death-menacing hours, when a woman's only comfort lies in having her dear husband by her, I had to remain alone, alone with that consciousness, awful beyond everything, that this dear husband was gone to the war, knowing, too, that it must be just as painful to him to leave his poor wife at such a moment as it would be painful to me to be without him. It was in the morning of 20th June. All the details of this memorable day remain impressed on my memory. 
oppressive heat prevailed outside, and to shut this out the Venetian blinds had been let down in my room. Covered with light, loose clothing, I was lying exhausted on the sofa. I had passed an almost sleepless night, and had now shut my eyes in a dreamy half-doze. Near me on my table was standing a vase with some powerfully smelling roses. Through the open window, the sound of a distant exercise in trumpet playing came. Everything was provocative of slumber, yet consciousness had not quite left me. Only one half of it, I mean that of care, had departed. I had forgotten the danger of war and the danger that stood before myself. I knew only that I was alive, that the roses, along with the rhythm of the reveille which the trumpeter was playing, were giving out sweet, soothing influences, that my beloved husband might come in at any minute, and if he saw me asleep, would only tread in the lightest manner so as not to awaken me. I was right. Next minute, the door opposite to me opened. Without raising my lids, I could see through a tiny cleft between the eyelashes that it was he whom I was expecting. I made no attempt to rouse myself from my half-slumber, for by doing so I might chase away the whole picture, for it might be that the appearance at the door was only the continuation of a dream, and it might be that I was only dreaming that I had opened my eyelids ever so little. So now I shut them entirely, and took pains to continue the dream, that the dear one came closer, that he bent over me and kissed my forehead, and so indeed it was. Then he knelt down by my couch and remained motionless for a while. The roses were still breathing, and the distant horn playing its tra ra ra Martha, are you asleep? I heard him ask softly. Then I opened my eyes. For God's sake, what is it? I cried out, frightened to death. For the countenance of my husband as he knelt by me was so deeply overclouded by sorrow that I guessed at once that some misfortune had happened. Instead of replying, he laid his head on my breast. I understood all. He had to go. I had thrown my arm round his neck, and we remained both in the same position for some time without speaking. When? I asked at length. Early tomorrow morning. <gasps> oh, my God! My God! Calm yourself, my poor Martha. No, no, let me weep. My misfortune is too great, and I know, I see it in your face, so is yours. Never did I see so much pain in any human face as I have just read in your features. Yes, my wife, I am unfortunate to have to leave you in such a moment. Frederick, Frederick, we shall never see each other again. I shall die. Or I shall fall. Yes, I believe it too. We shall never see each other again. It was a heart-breaking parting that occupied these last twenty-four hours. This was now the second time in my life that I had seen a dear husband depart to the war, but this second tearing ourselves apart was incomparably worse than the first. Then my way of taking it, and still more Arno's, was quite different and more primitive. I looked on the departure as a natural necessity which overbalanced all personal feelings, and he looked at it even as a joyous expedition in search of glory. He went with cheerfulness. I remained without a murmur. There still clung to me something of the admiration for war, which I had imbibed from my youthful education. I still shared to some extent with the departing soldier in the pride which he visibly felt in the great emprise. But now I knew that he who was going went to the work of death with horror rather than with exultation. I knew that he loved the life which he had to set on the hazard, that to him one thing was dearer than everything, yes, everything, even the claims of the Augustinebergs, his wife, his wife, who in a few days was to be a mother, whilst in Arno's case I had the conviction that he departed with feelings for which he was surely to be envied. I discerned that in this second separation both of us were deserving of equal pity. Yes, we suffered in equal measure, and we confessed it and bewailed it to each other. No hypocrisies, no empty phrases of consolation, no swagger. We were one in all things, and neither sought to deceive the other. It was still our best consolation that each could fully understand the other's inconsolability. We did not seek to conceal the magnitude of the misfortune that had burst on us by any conventional cloaks or masks of patriotism or heroism. No, 
The prospect of being allowed to shoot and hack at the Danes was to him no compensation for the anguish of having to leave me. On the contrary, rather an aggravation, for killing and destroying is repulsive to every noble man. And to me it was no recompense, absolutely none, for my suffering to think that my dear one might perhaps gain a step in rank. And should the misfortune of this perilous separation rise to the still greater misfortune of parting for ever, should Frederick fall? The reasons of state on account of which this war had to be waged were not in the faintest degree elevated, or holy enough to my mind to balance such a sacrifice. Defender of his country, that is the fair-sounding title with which the soldier is decorated. And in fact, what nobler duty can there be for the members of a commonwealth than to defend their state when menaced? But then why does his military oath bind the soldier to a hundred other warlike duties besides the defensive? Why is he obliged to go and attack? Why must he, in cases where there is not the slightest menace of any invasion of his country, hazard the same possessions, his life and his hearth, in the quarrels of certain foreign princes for territory or ambition, as if it were a question, as it surely ought to be, to justify war, of the defense of endangered life and hearth? Why, for example, in the present instance, must the Austrian army march out to set the Augustinburgs on a foreign throne? Why? Why? The question is one which to address to an emperor or pope is in itself treasonable and blasphemous, which in the latter case passes for irreligion and in the former for want of loyalty, and which never deserves an answer. The regiment was to march at 10 a.m. We stayed up the whole night. Not a minute of the time still left to us to spend together would we lose. There was so much that we had still to say to each other, and yet we spoke little. It was mainly kisses and tears, which said more plainly than any words, I love you, and I have to leave you. From time to time there dropped in a hopeful word, When you come back again, it was certainly possible. Surely there are so many that come back, yet it was strange, I repeated, When you come back, and tried to put before myself the delights of this event, but in vain. My imagination could form no other picture than that of my husband's corpse on the field of battle, or myself on the bier with a dead child in my arms. Frederick was filled with similar gloomy forebodings, for his, when I come back, did not sound natural, and more often he spoke of what might happen if I should fall. Do not marry a third time, Martha. Do not wash out by the impressions of a new love, the recollections of this glorious year. Has it not been a happy time? We now recalled a hundred little details which had impressed themselves on our minds, from our first meeting to the present hour, and passed them through our remembrance. And my little one, my poor little one, whom perhaps I may never press to my heart, what is its name to be? Frederick or Frederica? No, Martha is prettier. If it is a girl, call it by the name which its dying father at the last moment Frederick, why do you talk always about dying? If you come back... Ah, if, he repeated with a sigh. As the day was beginning to dawn, my eyes, weary with weeping, closed. A light slumber fell on both of us. We lay there with our arms linked together, but without losing the consciousness that this was our parting hour. Suddenly I started up and broke out into loud groans. Frederick got up at once. In God's name, Martha, what is the matter with you? It is not yet come. Oh, speak. Is it? I nodded affirmatively. Was it a cry or a curse or an ejaculation of prayer that escaped his lips? He clutched the bell and gave the alarm. Run at once for the doctor, for the nurse, he shouted to the maid who had hurried in. Then he threw himself down on his knees beside me and kissed my hand as it hung down. My wife, my all, and now, now I have to go. I could not speak. The most violent physical pain that one can conceive was racking and wringing my body, and besides this, the agony of my soul was yet more horrible. That he had to go now, now, and that he was so wretched about it. Those who had been summoned came quickly, and at once made themselves busy about me. At the same time, Frederick had to make his last preparations for the march. After he had done this, 
Doctor, doctor, he cried, seizing the physician by both hands. You promise me, do you not, that you will bring her through, and you will telegraph me today, and afterwards there and there, naming the stations which he had to pass on the march. And if there is any danger... Ah, but what good is it? He interrupted himself. If even the danger were ever so great, could I come back then? It is hard, Baron, the physician replied. But do not be too anxious. The patient is young and strong. This evening it will be all over, and you will receive a tranquilizing dispatch. Oh, yes. You mean to send good news in any case, because the opposite would do no good. But I will have the truth. Listen, doctor, I must have your most sacred word of honour on it. The whole truth. Only on this condition could a tranquilizing account really give me tranquility. Otherwise, I should think it all a lie. So swear to do this. The physician gave the promise required. End of section 27. Section 28 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 7, Part 2. Oh, my poor, poor husband! The thought cut me to the soul. Even if you receive the news today that your Martha is lying on her deathbed, you cannot turn back to close her eyes. You have something more important on hand, the claims of the Augustenburgs to a throne. Frederick, I cried out loud. He flew to my side. At this moment the clock struck. He had now only a minute or two, but we were cheated out of even this last respite, for another attack seized me, and instead of the words of adieu, I could only utter groans of anguish. Go, Baron, finish this scene, said the physician. For the patient, such excitement is dangerous. One more kiss, and he rushed out. My cries and the doctor's last word, dangerous, gave him his dismissal. In what frame of mind must he have been when he departed? The local newspapers of Old Mutz gave this report next day. Yesterday, the regiment left our town with music playing and banners waving, to gain fresh laurels for themselves in the sea-surrounded brotherland. Cheerful courage filled the ranks. One could see the joy of battle glowing in the men's eyes, and so on, and so on. Frederick had already telegraphed to Anne Mary before his departure that I was in want of her help, and she came a few hours later to me. She found me senseless and in great danger. For several weeks I hovered between life and death, my child died the day of its birth. The mental pain, which parting from my beloved husband had caused me, just at the time when I wanted all my strength to master the bodily pain, had rendered me incapable of bearing up against it, and I was near succumbing altogether. The physician was obliged by his plighted word to send my poor husband the sorrowful news that the child was dead, and the mother in danger of death. As to the news which came from him, they could not be communicated to me. I knew no one and was delirious day and night. A strange delirium. I brought back with me a feeble reminiscence of it into the period of recovered consciousness, but to reproduce this in reasonable words would be impossible for me. In the abnormal whirl of the fevered brain, conceptions and images form themselves for which there is no expression in language suitable to our normal thoughts. Only so much can I set down, and I have attempted to fix a fantastic sketch in the red volumes, that I confuse the two events, the war and my confinement, together. I fancy that cannon and naked weapons, I distinctly felt the bayonet thrusts, were the instruments of delivery, and that I was lying there the prize of contention between two armies rushing on each other. That my husband had marched out I knew, but I saw him still in the form of the dead Arnaud, while by my side, Frederick dressed as a sick nurse, was stroking the silver stork. Every moment I was awaiting the bursting shell which was to shatter us all three. Arnaud, 
Frederick, and me, to pieces, in order that the child could come into the world, who was destined to rule over Denstein, Schlesmark, and Holwig, and all this gave me such unspeakable pain, and was so unnecessary. There must, however, be someone somewhere who could change it and remove it all, who could lift off this mountain from my heart, and that of all humanity, by some word of power. And I was devoured with a longing to cast myself at this somebody's feet, and pray to him, Help us, for the sake of mercy and justice, help us, Lay down your arms. Down. With this cry on my lips, I woke one day to consciousness. My father and Aunt Mary were standing at the foot of the bed, and the former said to me to hush me. Yes, yes, child, be quiet. All arms down. The recovery of the sense of personality, after a long suspension of the intellect, is certainly a strange thing. First the joyful, astonished discovery that one is alive, and then the anxious questioning with oneself who one really is. But the sudden answer to that question, which burst in with full light upon me, changed the just awakened pleasure of existence into violent pain. I was the sick Martha Tilling, whose newborn child was dead, and whose husband was gone to battle. How long ago? That I knew not. Is he alive? Have you letters there? Messages? were my first questions. Yes, there was quite a little heap of letters and telegrams piled up, which had come during my illness. Most of them were merely inquiries about my condition, requests for daily, and as far as possible, hourly information. This, of course, was so long as the writer was at places where the telegraph could reach him. I was not permitted to read Frederick's letters at once, they thought it would excite me too much and disturb me, and now that I was hardly awake out of my delirium, I must, before all things, have repose. They could tell me as much as this. Frederick was unhurt up to the present time. He had already been through several successful engagements. The war must now soon be over. The enemy maintained themselves at Alsen only, and if this position once were taken, our troops would return, crowned with glory. This was what my father said for my comfort, and Aunt Mary gave me the history of my illness. Several weeks had now passed since her arrival, which was the very day on which Frederick departed, and my child was born and died. Of that I had preserved a recollection, but what passed in the interval, my father's arrival, the news that had come from Frederick, the course of my illness, of all that I knew nothing. Now I heard for the first time, that my condition had become so much worse that the medical man had quite given me up, and my father had been called to see me for the last time. The bad news must certainly have been sent to Frederick, but the better news also, for the doctors had given hope again some days ago, must by this time have reached him. If he himself is still alive, I struck in with a deep sigh. Do not commit a sin, Martha, my aunt admonished me. The good God and his saints would not have preserved you, in answer to our prayers, in order afterwards to send such a visitation upon you. Your husband also will be preserved to you, for whom I, you may believe me when I say so, have prayed as fervently as for you. I have even sent him a scapulary. Oh, yes, do not shrug your shoulders. You have no trust in such things but they can do no harm anyhow, can they? And how many proofs there are of their good effect? You, yourself, are again another proof what effect the intervention of the saints has. For you were, believe me, on the edge of the grave when I addressed myself to your patron and protectress, St. Martha. And I interrupted my father, who was very clerical indeed in his politics, but in the practical way did not at all sympathize with his sister. I wrote to Vienna for Dr. Braun, and he saved your life. Next day, on my urgent prayer, I was permitted to read through all the messages that had come from Frederick. Mostly there were only questions in a single line, or news equally laconic. An engagement yesterday. I am unhurt. We march again today. Send messages to... 
A longer letter bore this direction on the envelope. To be delivered only if all danger is over. This I read last. My all. Will you ever read this? The last news which reached me from your physician ran. Patient in high fever. Condition grave. Grave? He used the expression, perhaps out of consideration, so as not to say, hopeless. If you have this put into your hands, you will know by that that you have escaped the danger. But you may think, in addition, what my feelings were, as, on the eve of a battle, I pictured to myself that my adored wife was lying on her deathbed, that she was calling for me, stretching out her arms for me. We did not even say any regular adieu to each other, and our child, about whom I had had such joy, dead. And tomorrow, I myself, suppose a bullet find me. If I knew beforehand that you were no more, the mortal shot would be the dearest thing to me. But if you are preserved, no, then I do not wish to know anything more of death. The joy of dying, that unnatural feeling which the field preachers are always pressing on us, is one no happy man can know. And, if you are alive, and I reach home, I have still untold treasures of bliss to gather. Oh, the joy of living with which we too will enjoy the future, if any such is to be our lot. Today we met the enemy for the first time. Up to that, our way had been through conquered territory, from which the Danes had retreated. Smoking ruins of villages, ravaged cornfields, weapons and knapsacks lying about, spots where the land was plowed up by the shells, bloodstains, bodies of horses, trenches filled with the slain. Such are the features of the scenes through which we have been moving in the rear of the victors, in order, if possible, to add more victories to the account, i.e., to burn more villages, and so forth. And that we have done today. We have carried the position. Behind us lies a village in flames, the inhabitants had the good luck to have quitted it beforehand. But in the stable a horse had been forgotten. I heard the beast in despair, stamping and shrieking. Do you know what I did? It will procure me no decoration, most certainly. For, instead of bringing down a Dane or two, I rushed to the stable to set the poor horse free. Impossible. The manger had already caught fire. Then the straw under his hoofs. Then his mane so I put two revolver bullets through his head. He fell down dead, and was saved from the pain of being burned to death. Then, back into the fight, the deathly smell of the powder, the wild alarm of the whistling bullets, falling buildings, savage war cries. Most of those around me, friends and foes, were, it is true, seized by the delirium of battle, but I remained in blessed sobriety. I could not get myself up to hate the Danes. They are brave men, and what did they do but their duty in attacking us? My thoughts were with you, Martha. I saw you laid out on your bier, and what I wished for myself was that the bullet might strike me. But at intervals, nevertheless, a ray of longing and of hope would shine again. What if she is alive? What if I should get home again? The butchery lasted more than two hours and we remained, as I said, in possession of the field. The routed enemy fled. We did not pursue. We had work enough to do on the field. A hundred paces distant from the village stood a large farmhouse, with many empty dwelling rooms and stables. Here we were to rest for the night, and hither we have brought our wounded. The burial of the dead is to be done tomorrow morning. Some of the living will, of course, be shoveled in with them, for the stiff cramp after a severe wound is a common phenomenon. Many who have remained out, whether dead or wounded, or even unwounded, we are obliged to abandon entirely, especially those who are lying under the ruins of the fallen houses. There they may, if dead, moulder slowly where they are. If wounded, bleed slowly to death. If unwounded, die slowly of famine. And we... Hurrah! May go on with our jolly, joyous war. The next engagement will probably be a general action. According to all appearance, there will be two entire corps d'armée opposed to each other. 
The number of the killed and wounded may in that case easily rise to ten thousand, for when the cannons begin their work of vomiting out death, the front ranks on both sides are soon wiped out. It is certainly a wonderful contrivance, but still better would it be if the science of artillery could progress to such a point that any army could fire a shot, which would smash the whole army of the enemy at one blow. Then, perhaps, all waging of war would be entirely given up. Force would then, provided the total power of the two combatants were equally great, no longer be looked to for the solution of questions of right. Why am I writing all this to you? Why do I not break out, as a warrior should, into exalted hymns of triumph over our warlike work? Why? Because I thirst after truth, and after its expression without any reserve. Because at all times I hate lying phrases. But at this moment, when I am so near death myself, and am speaking to you who, perhaps, are yourself lying in the death agony, it presses on me doubly to speak what is in my heart. Even though a thousand others should think differently, or should hold themselves bound at least to speak differently, I will, nay, I must say it once more before I fall a sacrifice to war. I hate war. If only every man who feels the same would dare to proclaim it aloud, what a threatening protest would be shouted out to heaven. All the hurrahs which are now resounding, and all the cannon thunder that accompanies them, would then be drowned by the battle cry of humanity panting after humanity, by the victorious cry denouncing war on war. Half past three in the morning. I wrote the above last night. Then I lay down on a sack of straw and slept for an hour or two. We shall break up in half an hour, and then I shall be able to give this to the field post. All is stirring now and getting ready for the march. Poor fellows! They have got little rest since the bloody work accomplished yesterday, little refreshment for that which is to be accomplished today. I began with a turn round our improvised field hospital, which is to remain here. There, I saw among the wounded and dying, a pair for whom I would gladly have done the same as for the horse in the fire, put a bullet as a coup de grace through their heads. One was a man who had had his whole lower jaw shot away, and the other... But enough. I cannot help him. Nothing can but death. Unfortunately, he is often so slow. If a man calls in despair for him, he stands deaf before him. On the other hand, he is far too busy in snatching those away who with all their heart are hoping to recover and calling on him beseechingly. Oh, spare me, for I have a beloved wife pining for me at home. My horse is saddled, so now I must close these lines. Farewell, Martha, if you are still here. End of section 28. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 29 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 7, Part 3. Luckily, there were tidings of a later date in the packet than the letter above quoted. After the great battle predicted in the last, Frederick had been able to tell me, The day is ours. I am unhurt. These are two pieces of good news, the first for your papa, the second for you. But I cannot overlook the fact that the same day has brought numberless griefs to numberless others. In another letter, Frederick related how he had met with his cousin Godfrey. Picture to yourself my astonishment. Whom should I see riding before me at the head of a detachment but Anne Cornelius' only son? How the poor woman must be trembling for him. The young man himself is all eagerness and love of battle. I saw it in his proud, joyful bearing, and he has also told me so. We were encamped together the same evening, and I invited him into my tent. It is indeed splendid, he cried out in rapture, that we are fighting in the same cause, cousin, and together. 
Am not I in luck that war should have broken out in the first year of my lieutenancy? I shall gain the cross of merit. And my aunt, how did she take your departure? Oh, in the mother's way, with tears, which she did all she could to hide, so as not to damp my spirit, with blessings, with grief, and with pride. And what were your feelings when you first got into the melee? Oh, delightful, ennobling. You need not use falsehood to me, my dear boy. It is not the staff officer who is asking about your feelings as a lieutenant bound to duty, but a man and a friend. I can only repeat, delightful and ennobling. Awful, I grant, but so magnificent, and the consciousness that I am fulfilling with God's help the highest duty of a man to king and country, and further, that I see death, the specter elsewhere so feared and shunned, so close and busy all around me, his very breath breathing over me. The thought raises me to a mood of mind so elevated above the common, so epic that I feel the muse of history hovering over our heads and lending our swords the might of victory. A noble rage glows in me against the presumptuous foe, who would have trampled on the rights of the German countries, and it is to me an enthusiasm to have the power of gratifying this hatred. It is a curious, mysterious thing, this power of killing, nay, this compulsion to kill, without being a murderer, with a fearless exposure of one's own life. So the boy chattered on. I let him talk. I had similar feelings when my first battle was raging round me. Epic, yes. There you hit on the right word. The heroic poems and the heroic histories, by whose means our schools bring us up to be warriors, these are what are set vibrating in our brains by the thunders of the cannonade, the flash of naked weapons, and the shouts of the combatants and the freedom from ordinary circumstances, the inexplicable freedom from law in which one finds oneself all of a sudden, makes one feel as if transported into another world. It is like an outlook beyond this trumpery earthly existence, with its peaceful domestic quiet, into a titanic struggle of infernal spirits. But this getting is soon passed over with me, and it is only with an effort that I can bring back to my mind the sensations which young Tessau sketched to me. I recognized too soon that the desire for battle was not a superhuman, but an infrahuman feeling. No mystic revelation from the realms of the morning, but a reminiscence of the realm of the animal, a reawakening of the brutal. And a man who can intoxicate himself into a savage lust for blood, who, as I have seen several of our men do, can cut down with uplifted saber an unarmed enemy, who can sink into a berserker, or lower still, a bloodthirsty tiger. That is the man who, for the moment, revels in the joy of battle. I never did this. Believe me, my wife, I never did. Godfrey is delighted that we Austrians are united in fighting for the right cause. How does he know that? as if every cause is not always represented as the right one by its own side, with the Prussians. Yes, we Germans are all one united people of brothers. That was seen long ago in the Thirty Years' War, and also in the Seven Years' War, I struck in half aloud. Godfrey missed what I said, and went on. For each other, and with each other, we can conquer every foe. What will you say, then, my young friend, if to-day or to-morrow the Prussians and the Austrians quarrel, and we too shall be ranged as foes against one another. Not conceivable, now, after the blood of both of us has flowed for the same cause. Now surely we can never more... Never more? I would warn you not to use the expression never, or forever, in political matters. What ephemerides are in the scale of living beings... Such are the friendships and enmities of nations in the scale of historical phenomena. I write all this down, Martha, not that I think it can interest you, poor sufferer, nor because I want to make reflections to you upon it, but I have an idea that I shall fall, and in that case I do not wish my sentiments to sink into the grave with me unuttered. 
My letter may even be found and read by others, if not by you. That which is coming up in the minds of soldiers who think freely and feel like men shall not remain forever unspoken and concealed. I have dared it, was Ulrich V. Hutton's motto. I have spoken it, and with this to quiet my conscience, I can depart this life. The most recent news that had reached me had been sent off five days, and arrived two days previously. What was to show that in five days, five days of war, anything might not have taken place? Anxiety and fear seized me. Why had no line come yesterday? Why none today? Oh, this longing for a letter. Or, better, a telegram. I believe no one in the tortures of fever can so long for water as I then was longing for news. I was saved. He would have the great joy of finding me alive. If, always this if, which nips every hope for the future in the bud. My father was obliged to depart. He could now leave me with a quiet mind. The danger was over, and he had now pressing business at Grummet's. As soon as I had got the needful strength, I was to follow him there with my little Rudolph. A stay in the fresh country air would in the first place restore me entirely, and would also do good to the little boy. Aunt Mary stayed behind. She was to keep on nursing me, and then to travel with us to Grummet's, where Rosa and Lily had already gone on before. I let them talk and make plans for me. Without saying anything, I had made up my mind, as soon as I was even half able to do so, to set off for Schleswig-Holstein. Where Frederick's regiment might be at this moment, we knew not. It was impossible to get any dispatch forwarded to him, or I should have liked to telegraph to him every hour, and to ask, Are you alive? You must not excite yourself so, my father preached to me, as he took leave of me, or else you are sure to get a relapse again. Two days without news. What is there in that? There is really no reason at all for anxiety. There are not letter boxes or telegraph stations all over the field of battle, leaving out of the question that a man during the march and the battle and the bivouac is in no condition to write. The field post does not always act regularly, and so one may easily remain a fortnight without news. And still, that signify nothing bad. In my time, I have often been longer without writing home. But no one was anxious about me on that account. How do you know that, Papa? I am sure that your relations tremble for you just as much as I am trembling for Frederick. Did you not, Aunt? We had more trust in God than you have, she replied. We knew that a merciful providence would so order it, that, whether we got any news or none, your father would come back to us. And if I had never come back, but had got smashed to bits, you would have had enough love for your country to allow that so small a thing, as the life of an individual soldier, quite vanishes in the great cause for which he has parted with it. You, my daughter, have not for a long time been patriotic enough. But I will not scold you now. The main point is that you should get well again, and preserve yourself for your Rudy to make a brave man of him, and bring him up to be a defender of his country. End of section 29. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 30 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 7, Part 4. I did not get well so quickly as was hoped at first. The continued absence of news threw me into such excitement and misery that I never really got out of a feverish condition. My nights were filled with horrible phantoms, and my days passed in weary longing or troubled stupor, so that it was difficult to get my strength up again. Once, after a night in which I had had peculiarly terrifying visions, Frederick alive, but buried under a heap of corpses of men and horses, a relapse actually set in, which again brought me in danger of my life. 
My poor Aunt Mary had a hard time of it. She thought it a duty to preach comfort and resignation to me unceasingly, and her reason for it, the destiny which was constantly coming in again, had the effect of irritating me to the extreme, and instead of letting her quietly prose away, I set myself to contradict her passionately, to complain of my fate in defiance of her, and to assure her in plain terms that her destiny seemed to me folly. All this, of course, sounded blasphemous, and my good aunt not only felt herself personally insulted, but she trembled, also, for my rebellious soul, so soon, perhaps, to appear before the judgment seat. There was only one means to quiet me for a few minutes. That was to bring little Rudolph into my bedroom. "'You beloved child of mine, you are my comfort, my stay, my future.' This is what I cried out in my inward soul to the boy whenever I saw him. But he did not like staying long in the darkened sick room. It struck him as uncanny to see his mamma, who used to be so gay, now lying constantly in bed, pale and exhausted with weeping. He became himself quite out of spirits, and so I only kept him with me for a few minutes at a time. Frequent inquiries and news came from my father. He had written to Frederick's colonel, and to several other people besides, but had no answer as yet. When any list of killed and wounded came in, he would send me a telegram. Frederick not there. Oh, perhaps you are deceiving me, I once asked my aunt. Perhaps the news of his death has arrived long ago, and you are concealing it from me. I swear to you. On your honor? On your soul? On my soul. Such an assurance as this did me more good than I can tell, for I clung with all my might to my hope. Every hour I was expecting the arrival of a letter, of a telegram. At every noise in the next room, I fancied that it was the postman. Almost continually my eyes were turning towards the door, with a constant picture of someone coming in with the blessed message in his hand. When I look back on those days, they seem to present themselves, to my memory, as a whole year filled with torture. The next gleam of light for me was the news that a suspension of arms had again been agreed on. This must surely, this time, be the presage of peace. On the day after the receipt of this intelligence, I sat up for a little while for the first time. Peace! What a sweet, what a happy thought! Perhaps too late for me. No matter. I felt myself anyhow unspeakably calmed. At any rate, I had no need to fancy every day, every hour, the raging battle going on in which Frederick might, at that moment, be killed. Thank God! Now you will soon be well, said my aunt, one day after helping me to seat myself on a couch, which had been moved to the open window for me. And then we can go to Grummet's. As soon as I have strength for it, I am going to Alson. To Alson? My dear child, what are you thinking about? I want to find the place there where Frederick was either wounded or... I could not finish the sentence. Shall I fetch little Rudolph? said my aunt after a pause. She knew that this was the best way to chase away my troubled thoughts for a time. No, not yet. I want to be quite quiet and alone. It would be doing me a kindness, and if even you would go into the next room. Perhaps I may sleep a little. I feel so weak. Very well, my dear, I will leave you quiet. There is a bell here on the table by you. If you want anything, someone will be ready at once. Has the letter carrier been here? No, it is not post time yet. If he comes, call me. I lay down and shut my eyes. My aunt went out softly. All the people in the house had lately adopted this inaudible walk. I did not want to sleep, but to be alone with my thoughts. I was in the same room, on the same couch, as on that afternoon when Frederick came to tell me, We have got marching orders. It was just as sultry again as on that day, and again there were roses breathing in a vase near me and again the trumpet exercise was sounding from the barracks. I could return entirely into the frame of mind of that day. I wished I could go to sleep again in the same way, and dream as I then fancied I dreamt. 
that the door opened gently, and my beloved husband entered. The roses were smelling even more powerfully, and through the open window the distant tra-ra-ra was sounding. By degrees my consciousness of present things vanished. I felt myself ever more and more transported into that hour. All was forgotten that it had been since, and only the one fixed idea became even more intense, that at any moment the door might open, and give my dear one admission. But to this end I had to dream that I was keeping my eyes only half open. It was an effort to force myself to this, but it succeeded. I opened my eyelids ever so little, and... And there it was, the entrancing vision. Frederick, my beloved Frederick, on the threshold, with a loud sob and covering my face with both hands, I roused myself from my dreamy state. It was clear to me, at a stroke, that this was only a hallucination, and the heavenly ray of happiness that had been poured round me by this delusion made the hellish night of my misery seem all the blacker to me. "'Oh, my Frederick, my lost one!' I groaned. "'Martha, my wife! What was that?' a real voice, his own, and real arms that were thrown eagerly round me. It was no dream. I was lying on my husband's breast. End of section 30. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 31 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 8, Part 1. As in the last hours of his departure, our pain had expressed itself in tears and kisses more than in words. So it was in this hour of our seeing each other again. That one can become mad with joy, I plainly felt, as I felt fast him, whom I had believed to be lost, as sobbing and laughing and trembling with excitement. I kept clasping the dear head again between both my hands, and kissing him on the forehead and eyes and mouth, while I stammered out unmeaning words. On my first cry of joy, Aunt Mary hurried in from the next room. She also had had no idea of Frederick's return and at his sight she sank on the nearest chair with a loud cry of, Jesus, Maria, and Joseph. It was a long time before the first tumult of joy had sufficiently subsided to allow space for questions and counter-questions on both sides, confidences and news. Then we found that Frederick had been left lying in a peasant's house while his regiment marched on. The wound was not a severe one, but he lay for several days in a fever, unconscious. During this period no letters reached him, nor was it possible for him to send any. When he recovered, the suspension of arms had been proclaimed, and the war was virtually at an end. Nothing prevented his hastening home. At that time, he did not write or telegraph any more, but traveled night and day in order to get home as soon as possible. Whether I was still alive, whether I was out of danger, he knew not. He would not even make any inquiry about it. Only get there. Get there without losing an hour, and without cutting off the hope from his homeward journey, of finding his dearest again. And this hope was not frustrated. He had now found his dearest again, saved and happy, happy above all measure. In a little while, we all removed to my father's country seat. Frederick had obtained a long leave for the restoration of his health, and the means prescribed by his physician, rest and good air, he could best find at our house at Grumitz. It was a happy time, that late summer. I do not recollect any period in my life which was more fair. Union, at last, with a loved one, long sighed for, may well be held infinitely sweet. But to me, the reunion with one half given up for lost, necessarily seemed almost sweeter still when i only for an instant brought back to my own memory the fearful feelings that had filled my heart before frederick's return 
or called up before myself again the pictures which had tormented my feverish nights of frederick suffering all kinds of death agonies and then satiated myself with his sight my heart leapt for joy i now loved him more a hundred times more my regained husband and i regarded the possession of him as ever-increasing riches a little while ago i looked on myself as a beggar now i had drawn the grand prize the whole family was assembled at grumet's otto too my brother was spending his holidays with us he was now fifteen years old and had three years to pass at the neustadt military academy at vienna a fine fellow my brother and my father's darling in pride he as well as lily and rosa filled the house with their merriment it was a constant laughing and romping and playing ball and rackets and all sorts of mad antics cousin conrad whose regiment lay not far from grumitz in garrison came as often as possible riding over and took his part gallantly in all these youthful sports the old folks formed a second party namely aunt mary my father and a few of his comrades who were staying as guests in the house among them there was serious card-playing quiet walks in the park a devoted cultivation of the pleasures of the table and immeasurable talks about politics the military events that had just taken place and the schleswig holstein question which the latter had by no means set at rest offered a rich field for these talks frederick and i lived practically separate or nearly so from the rest we only met them at meals and not always then we were allowed to do as we liked it was taken as a settled thing that we were going through a second edition of our honeymoon and that solitude suited us and indeed we were best pleased to be alone not at all as the others perhaps thought to play and caress in honeymoon fashion we were not newly married enough for that but because we found most satisfaction in mutual conversation after the heavy sorrows we had just passed through we could not share the naive gaiety of the youthful party and still less did we sympathize with the interests and the conversations of the dignified personages and so we preferred to secure for ourselves a good deal of retirement under the privilege of a pair of lovers which was tacitly granted to us we undertook long walks together sometimes excursions in the neighborhood in which we stayed away the whole day we spent whole hours alone together in the book-room, and in the evening, when the various card-parties were being made up, we retired into our rooms where, over tea and cigarettes, we resumed our familiar chat. We always found an infinity of things to say to each other. We liked best to tell each other of the feelings of woe and horror which we experienced during our separation, for this always awakened again the joy of our reunion. We agreed that presentiments of death and such like things are nothing but superstition, since both of us, from the hour of our leave-taking, had been penetrated with the conviction that one or the other must necessarily die, yet here we had each other back. Frederick had to recount to me, in detail, all the dangers and sufferings which he had just gone through, and to describe the pictures of horror from the battlefield and hospital which he had absorbed lately into his shuddering soul. I loved the tone of repugnance and pain which quivered in his voice during such recitals. From the way in which he spoke of the cruelties he had witnessed during the confusion of the war, I gathered the promise of an elevation of humanity, the results of which would be, first in individuals, then in the many, and finally in all to overcome the old barbarity. My father also, and Otto, often called upon frederick to interest them with episodes from the late campaign this indeed was done in quite a different spirit from that in which i begged for such stories and frederick's relation was given in quite a different spirit he contented himself with describing the tactical movements of the forces the events of the battles the names of the places taken or defended recounting single camp scenes repeating speeches which had been made by the generals, and such like miscellanea of the war. His audience was delighted with it. My father listened with satisfaction, 
Otto with admiration, the generals with the solemnity of experts. I alone could not find any relish in this dry style of narrative. I knew that this covered a whole world of feelings and thoughts which the matters related had awakened in the depths of the speaker's soul. When I once reproached him with this, when we were alone, he replied, Falsehood? Dishonesty? Want of enthusiasm? No, my dear, you are mistaken. It is mere decorum. Do you remember our wedding tour, our departure from Vienna, the first time we were alone in the carriage, the night in the hotel at Prague? Did you ever repeat the details of those hours, or ever sketch to your friends and relations the feelings and emotions of that happy time? No, of course not. Every woman must surely be silent about such things. Then don't you see that there are things also which every man is silent about? You could not tell of your joys and love, nor could we of our sufferings and war. The former might lay bare your chief virtue, modesty. The latter, ours, courage. The delights of the honeymoon, and the terrors of the battlefield. No womanly woman can speak of the one, nor any manly man of the other. What? You may, in the rapture of love, have poured out sweet tears, and I may have, in the imminence of the death agony, uttered a cry. How could you acknowledge such a sensibility? How could I such a cowardice? But did you cry out, Frederick? Did you tremble? You may surely say it to me. I do not, you know, conceal the joys of my love from you, and you may, to me, confess to you the fears of death which seize us soldiers on the field of battle? How can it be otherwise? Phrases and poetry tell lies about it. The inspiration, artificially caused in this way by phrases and poetry, is, I grant, capable, for an instant, of overcoming the natural instinct towards self-preservation, but only for an instant. In cruel men, the pleasure of killing and destroying may also, sometimes, chase away their fear for their own lives. In men tenacious of honor, Pride is capable of suppressing the outward manifestation of this fear. But how many of the poor young fellows have I not heard groaning and whimpering? What looks of despair, what faces agonized with the fear of death, have I not seen? What wild wailings and curses and beseeching prayers have I not heard? And that gave you pain, my good, gentle husband. Such pain often that I cried out, Martha, and yet too little to express properly my power of sympathy. One might think that if, at the sight of a single suffering, a man is seized with pity, a suffering multiplied a thousandfold would therefore excite a thousand times stronger pity. But the contrary occurs. The magnitude stupefies one. One cannot be so tenderly grieved for an individual when one sees, all around him, nine hundred and ninety-nine others just as miserable. But, even if one has not the capacity to feel beyond a certain level of compassion, yet one may be capable of thinking and computing that one has an inconceivable quantity of woe before one. You and one or two others may be capable, but the majority of men neither think nor compute. I succeeded in moving Frederick to the resolve of quitting the service. The circumstance that he had, after his marriage, served now more than a year, and taken a distinguished part in a campaign, would defend him from the suspicion which had occurred to my father during our engagement, that the whole marriage had, for its object, only to enable him to give up his career. Now, when peace should once be made, the preliminaries of which were in train, and when, to all probability, there were long years of peace in prospect, Retirement from the army would now not involve anything dishonorable. It was, indeed, still, to some extent, repugnant to Frederick's pride to give up his rank and income, and, as he said, to do nothing, to be nothing, and to have nothing. But his love for me was, with him, an even more powerful feeling than his pride, and he could not resist my entreaties. I declared that I could not go through a second time, the anguish of mine which his last parting caused me, and he himself might well shrink from again, calling down on us both such pain. 
the feeling of delicacy which before his marriage with me made him shrink from the idea of living on the fortune of a rich woman no longer came into play for we had become so completely one that there was no longer any perceptible difference between mine and yours and we understood each other so well that no misjudgment of his character on my part was any longer to be feared the last campaign had besides so greatly increased his aversion to the murderous duties of war and his unqualified expression of that aversion had so rooted it in him that his retirement got to appear not like a concession made to our domestic happiness so much as the putting into action of his own intention as a tribute to his convictions and so he promised me in the coming autumn if the negotiations for peace were then concluded to take his discharge we planned buying an estate with my fortune, which was then in the hands of Schmidt and Sons, the bankers, and Frederick was to find employment in managing it. In this way, the first part of his trouble, doing nothing, being nothing, and having nothing, would be removed. As to being and having, we could also find a remedy. To be a retired colonel in the imperial and royal service and a happy man, is not that enough? I asked. And to have? You have us, me and Rudy, and those who are coming. Is that not enough, too? He smiled and took me in his arms. We did not choose, just at first, to communicate anything of our plans to my father and the rest. They would certainly raise objections, give pieces of advice, express disapprobation, and all that was quite superfluous as yet. Later on, we should know how to put ourselves above all that, for, when two people are all in all to each other, all foreign opinion falls off them without making any impression. The certainty for the future thus obtained increased still more enjoyment of the present, which, even without that, was so heightened and enlarged by the delirium of the bitter past which we had gone through. I can only repeat it was a happy time. My son Rudolph, now a little fellow of seven, was beginning, at this time, to learn reading and writing, and his instructress was myself. I had never given my bond the delight, which, besides, would, I dare say, have been none for her, of seeing this little soul slowly expand, and of bringing to it the first surprises of knowledge. The boy was often the companion of our walks, and we were never tired of answering the questions which his growing appetite for knowledge made him address to us, to answer, that is, as well and as far as we could. We never permitted ourselves to tell a falsehood. We never avoided answering such questions as we could not decide, such as no man can decide, with a plain, That no one knows, Rudy. At first it would happen that Rudolph, not satisfied with such an answer, took his questions sometimes to Aunt Mary, or to his grandfather, or to the nurse, and then he always got unhesitating solutions. Then he would come back to us in triumph. You don't know how old the moon is? I know now. It's six thousand years. You remember. Frederick and I exchanged a silent glance. A whole volume full of pedagogic fault-finding and opinions was contained in that glance and that silence. Above all things unbearable to me were the soldiers' games which not only my father but my brother carried on with the boy. The idea of enemy and cutting down were thus instilled into him, I know not how. One day, Frederick and I came up as Rudolph was mercilessly beating two whimpering young dogs with a riding switch. That is a lying Italian, he said, laying on to one of the poor beasts, and that, on to the other, an impudent dame. Frederick snatched the switch out of the hand of this national corrector. And that is a cruel Austrian, he said, letting one or two good blows fall on Rudolph's shoulders. The Italian and the dame gladly ran off, and the whimpering was now done by our little countryman. You are not angry with me, Martha, for striking your son? I am not, it is true, in favor, generally, of corporal punishment but cruelty to animals provokes me. You did right, I said. Then is it only to men that one may be cruel? asked the boy between his sobs. 
Oh, no, still less. But you yourself have hit Italians and Danes. They were enemies. Then one may hate them? And today or tomorrow, said Frederick, aside to me, the priest will be telling him that one ought to love one's enemies. What logic? Then, aloud to Rudolph, No, it is not because we hate them that we may strike our foes, but because they want to strike us. And what do they want to strike us for? Because we wanted to... No, no, he interrupted himself. I find no way out of the circle. Go and play, Rudy. We forgive you, but don't do so any more. Cousin Conrad was, as I thought, making progress in Lily's favor. There is nothing like perseverance. I should have been very glad to see this match now made up, and I observed with pleasure how my sister's countenance lighted up with joy when the tread of Conrad's horse was heard in the distance, and how she sighed when he rode off again. He no longer courted her, i.e. he spoke no more of his love, and did not bring his suit forward, but his proceedings constituted a regular siege. As there are different ways of taking a fortress, he explained to me one day, by storm or by famine, so there are many ways of making a lady capitulate. One of the most effectual of these is custom, sympathy. It must touch her at length that I am so constant and loving, and so constant in keeping silence about it, and always coming again. If I should stay away, it would make a great gap in her way of life, and if I go on in this way some time longer, she will not be able to do without me at all. And how many times seven years do you mean to serve for your chosen one? I have not counted that up, till she takes me. I do admire you. Are there then no other girls in the world? Not for me. I have got Lily into my head. She has something in the corners of her mouth, in her gait, her way of speaking, that no other woman can equal for me. You, for example, Martha, are ten times as pretty and a hundred times as clever. Thank you. But I would not have you for a wife. Thank you. Just because you are too clever, you would be sure to look down on me from a higher level. The star on my collar, my saber, and my spurs do not impose on you. Lily, however, looks with respect on a man of action. I know she adores soldiers, while you... Still, I have twice married a soldier, replied I, laughing. End of section 31. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 32 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 8, Part 2. During meals, at the upper end of the table, where my father and his old friends gave the tone, and where Frederick and I also sat, the young folks at the other end had their own talk to themselves. Politics was the chief subject. That was the favorite material for conversation with the old gentleman. The negotiations for peace, which were in progress, gave sufficient ground for this display of wisdom, for it is a firm conviction of most people that political events form the most sterling matter for conversation, and that most suited for serious men. From gallantry and out of friendly regard for my female weakness of intellect, one of the generals said, by the way, these things can hardly interest our young friend Baroness Martha. We should only speak about them when we are alone. Eh, fair lady? I defended myself from this and begged them seriously to continue the subject. I took a real and an anxious interest in the proceedings of the military and diplomatic world. Not from the same point of view as these gentlemen, but it was of great moment to me to follow to its ultimate conclusion the Danish question whose origin and course I had studied so carefully during the war. Now, 
After these battles and victories, the fate of the disputed duchies must surely be settled, and yet the question and the doubts were always going on. The Augustenburg, that famous Augustenburg, on account of whose immemorial rights all the contests have been lighted up, was he then installed now? Nothing of the kind. Nay, a new pretender arrived on the scene. Glücksberg and Gottorp and all the lines and branch lines, whatever their names were, which I had been painfully committing to memory, were not enough. Now Russia stepped in, and opposed to the Augustenburg and Oldenburg. However, the result of the war up to this point was that the duchies were to belong neither to a Glucks, nor to an Augustin, nor to an Olden, nor to any other burg, but to the Allied victors. The following, I found out, were the articles of the conditions of peace then in progress. Number 1. Denmark surrenders the duchies to Austria and Prussia. I was pleased with that. The Allies would now, of course, hasten to give up the countries which they had conquered, not for themselves but for another, to that other. Number 2. The frontiers will be accurately defined. That again is quite right, if only these definitions could have a little more stability but it is pitiable even to see what everlasting shiftings these blue and green lines on the maps have to suffer unceasingly number three the public debts will be allocated in proportion to the populations that i did not understand in my studies i had not got up to questions of political economy and finance i took interest in politics only so far as they bore on peace and wars for this was the vital question to me, as a human being and a wife. Number four. The duchies bear the cost of the war. That again was to some extent intelligible to me. The country had been devastated, its harvests trampled down, its sons massacred. Some reparation was due to it, so let it pay the expenses of the war. And what news is there about Schleswig-Holstein? I asked myself as the conversation had not yet been brought into the field of politics. The latest news is, said my father, on August 13 that Herr V. Buist has put the question before the assembly of the Bund, with what right can the Allies accept the cession of the duchies from a king whom the Bund has never recognized as their lawful possessor? That is truly a very reasonable objection, I remarked for it surely means that the protocol prince is not the legitimate lord of German soil, and now you accept it solemnly from Christian the Ninth. You don't understand, dear, interrupted my father. It is only an impudence, a trick of this Herr V. Bust, nothing else. The duchies, besides, belong to us already, for we have conquered them. But surely not conquered them for yourselves, for the Augustenburg, that again you do not understand. The reasons, which before the outbreak of a war are put forward by the cabinets as the motive for it, retreat into the background as soon as the battles are once engaged. Then the victories and defeats bring out quite new combinations. Then kingdoms diminish or increase, or shape themselves in relations before unforeseen. These reasons, then, are really no reasons, but only pretexts? I asked. Pretext? No, said one of the generals coming to my father's aid. Motives, rather, starting points for the events, which then shape themselves according to the scale of the results. If I had had to speak, said my father, I would really not have given in to any peace negotiations after Dippo and Alton. All Denmark might have been conquered. What to do with it? Incorporate it in the German Bund. Why, your specialty is only that of an Austrian patriot, dear father. What business is it of yours to enlarge Germany? Have you forgotten that the Habsburgs were German emperors and may become so again? That would rejoice you? What Austrian would it not fill with joy and pride? But, remarked Frederick, suppose the other great power of Germany cherishes similar dreams. My father laughed outright. What? the crown of the Holy Romano-German Empire on the head of a Protestant kingling? Are you in your senses? Whether now or at another time, said Dr. Bresser, 
a quarrel will occur between the two powers over the object for which they have fought in alliance. To conquer the Elbe provinces, that was a trifle. But what to do with them? That may yet give occasion to all kinds of complications. Every war, however it may turn out, inevitably contains within itself the germ of a succeeding war. Very naturally, for an act of violence always violates some right. Sooner or later, this right raises its claims, and the new conflict breaks out, is then again brought to a conclusion by force, pregnant with injustice, and so on, ad infinitum. A few days later, a fresh event occurred. King William of Prussia paid a visit to the emperor at Schönbrunn. Extraordinarily warm reception, embraces, the Prussian eagle hoisted, Prussian popular hymns played by all the military bands, triumphant huzzas. To me, this news was satisfactory, for by it, the evil prophecies of Dr. Bresser were put to shame, that the two powers would get into a quarrel with each other over the countries they had joined in liberating. The newspapers also gave expression on all hands to this consolatory assurance. My father was equally pleased with the friendly news from Schönbrunn, not, however, from the point of view of peace, but of war. I am glad, he said, that we have now a new ally. In alliance with Prussia we can, just as easily as we have conquered the Elbe provinces, get Lombardy back again. Napoleon III will not consent to that, and Prussia will certainly not be willing to embroil herself with him, one of the generals said. Besides, it is a bad sign that Benedetti, the bitterest enemy of Austria, is now ambassador at Berlin. But tell me, gentlemen, I cried out, folding my hands together, why do not all the civilized states in Europe form an alliance? That surely would be the simplest way. The gentlemen shrugged their shoulders, smiled in a superior fashion, and gave me no answer. I had plainly given utterance again to one of those silly things which the ladies are in the habit of saying when they venture into the, to them, inaccessible region of the higher politics. End of section 32 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Section 33 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Sutner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 8, Part 3. The autumn had come. Peace was signed at Vienna on October 30, and with it had come the time when my darling wish, Frederick's retirement, could be carried out. But man proposes and circumstances master him. An event occurred, a heavy blow for me, which brought to nothing the plans we had cherished so joyfully. It was simply this. The house of Schmidt and Sons failed, and my whole private fortune was gone. This bankruptcy was also a sequel of the war. The shot and shells shatter not only the walls against which they are aimed, but, through this destruction, banking houses and financial companies over a wide area fall to pieces also. I was not brought thereby, as so many others were, to beggary, for my father would not let me want for anything, but the plan of retirement had to be quite given up. We were no longer independent persons. Frederick's pay was now our sole substantial resource. Even if my father could assure me a sufficient allowance, it was out of the question, under such circumstances, that Frederick should quit the service. I, myself, could not suggest it to him. What sort of a part would he be playing in the eye of my father? There was nothing to do. We had to submit." destiny in aunt mary's phrase i have not much to tell of the affliction which this great pecuniary loss caused me it was a question of several hundred thousand florins for there are no long entries in my diary about it and even my memory 
which has experienced since then so many impressions of far deeper pain, bears no longer any very lively traces of these incidents. I only know that I was chiefly sorry for the beautiful castle in the air which we had been building. Retirement, purchase of an estate, a life independent and apart from the so-called world, in other things, the loss did not hurt me so much. For, as I have said, my father would, during his life, not allow me to want for anything, and would, afterwards, leave me a sufficiency, and my son Rudolph was sure of wealth in the future. One thing comforted me. There was not the slightest prospect of any war. One might hope for ten or twenty years of peace. Till then... Schleswig, Holstein, and Lohenburg were finally given over, by the Treaty of October 30, to the free disposition of Prussia and Austria. These two, now the best of friends, were to share, in a brotherly way, the advantages so accruing, and find no cause for quarreling over them. Nowhere, on the whole political horizon, was there any black spot visible to one's consideration. The shame of the defeat we had sustained in Italy was sufficiently atoned by the military glory we had gained in Schleswig-Holstein, and so there was no longer any occasion for military ambition to conjure up new campaigns. And I was also pacified with the following consideration. That war had come so short a time since, I took as a pledge that it would not be very soon repeated. Sunshine follows after rain, and in the sunshine one forgets the rain. Even after earthquakes and eruptions of volcanoes, men build up new dwellings again and do not think of the danger of a repetition of the past catastrophe. A chief element in our life's energy appears to reside in forgetfulness. We took up our winter quarters in Vienna. Frederick had now got employment in the Ministry of War, a business which he, at any rate, preferred to barrack life. This year my sisters and Aunt Mary had gone to spend the carnival at Prague. That Conrad's regiment was quartered in the Bohemian capital was, perhaps, only a coincidence. Or could this circumstance have had any influence on their choice of a winter resort? When I gave a hint of this to my sister Lily, she blushed deeply and answered with a shrug of her shoulders, Why, you must know that I do not want him. My father repaired to his old dwelling in the Herengasse. He proposed to us that we should settle down with him as he had room enough, but we preferred to live by ourselves and hired an entresol on the Franz Joseph's quay. My husband's pay and the monthly allowance made me by my father amply sufficed for our modest housekeeping. We had indeed to renounce subscriptions to opera boxes, court balls, in fact, all going into society, but how easily did we renounce it? It was indeed a pleasure to us that my pecuniary losses made this quiet way of life necessary, for we loved a quiet way of life. To a small circle of relatives and friends, our house was always open. In particular, Lori Griesbach, the friend of my youth, often visited us, almost more often than I liked. Her talk, which had before appeared to me sorely superficial, I now found so insipid as to be quite wearisome, and her intellectual horizon, whose narrowness I had always perceived, seemed now still more restricted. But she was pretty and lively and coquettish. I understood that in society she turned many men's heads, and it was said that she had no objection to being made love to. What was very unpleasant to me was to perceive that Frederick was very much to her taste, and that she shot many darts out of her eyes at him, which were evidently intended to fix themselves in his heart. Laurie's husband, the ornament of the jockey club, the race course, and the coulisse, was well known to be so little true to her that a slight imitation on her side would not have deserved too strong condemnation. But that Frederick should serve as the medium of her revenge I had a good deal to say against that. I, jealous? I turned red as I caught myself in this agitation. I was, in truth, so sure of his heart. No other woman, none in the world, 
could he love as he did me? Ah, yes, love, but a little blaze of flirtation? That might, perhaps, have flashed up by the side of the soft glow which was consecrated to me. Lori did not, in any way, conceal from me how much Frederick attracted her. I say, Martha, you are really to be envied to have such a charming husband, or you should keep a good lookout on this Frederick of yours, for all the women I know are running after him. I am quite certain of his fidelity, I replied to this. Don't flatter yourself. To think of fidelity and husband being coupled together, that is impossible. For example, you know how my husband... Good heavens, you may perhaps have been wrongly informed. Besides, surely all men are not alike. Yes, they are. All, believe me. I know none of our gentlemen who do not. Among those who pay me attention are several married men. And what is their object? Certainly not to give me or themselves exercises in fidelity to marriage. I suppose they know you will not listen to them. And do you think Frederick belongs to this crew? I asked with a smile. That is more than I can tell you, you little goose. But, for all that, it is very good of me to let you know how much I am struck with him. Now, all you have to do is to keep your eyes open. My eyes are wide open already, Laurie, and they have, before now, observed with displeasure several attempts at coquetry on your part. Oh, that's it. Then I must disguise it better in future. We both laughed, but I still felt that, in the same way as behind the jealousy which I pretended for fun, a real movement of this passion lay hid. So behind the chat, with which she affected to tease me, there lay a germ of truth. The arrangement to marry my son Rudolph one day to Laurie's little Beatrix was still kept intact. It was, of course, more in play than in reality. The main question, whether the children's hearts would beat for each other, could only be decided by the future. That in a worldly point of view, my Rudolph would be a most eligible match was certain, and so much the more fastidious might be he in choosing. Beatrix, indeed, promised to be a great beauty, but if she took after her mother in coquetry and shallowness of mind, she would not be one I should desire for a daughter-in-law. But all that was in the far distance." Laurie's husband had not shared in the Schleswig-Holstein campaign, and that annoyed him much. Laurie, too, was grieved at this ill luck. Such a nice victorious war, she complained. Griesbach would have been sure to have got a step by this time. However, the comfort is that in the next campaign... What are you thinking of? I broke in. There is not the least prospect of that. Do you know any cause for it? What should a war be waged about now? What for? Really, I have nothing to do with that. Wars come, and there they are. Every five or six years, something breaks out. That is the regular course of history. But surely some reasons must exist for it. Perhaps, but who knows what they are? Certainly I don't, nor my husband either. I asked him in the course of the late war... What is the exact thing they are fighting about down there? I don't know, he replied, shrugging his shoulders. It is all the same to me. But it is a bore that I am not there, he added. Oh, Griesbach is a true soldier. The why and what for of the wars are not the business of the soldiers. The diplomatists settle that amongst themselves. I never bothered my brains about all these political squabbles. It is not the business of us women at all. We should, besides, understand nothing of it. When once the storm has broken, we have only to pray that it may strike our neighbors and not ourselves. That is certainly the most simple plan. End of section 33. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 34 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 8, Part 4. Dear Madam, a friend, or perhaps an enemy, no matter, a person who knows but wishes to remain unknown, takes this means of informing you that you are being betrayed. Your husband, so seeming virtuous, and your friend, who wants to pass for an innocent, are laughing at you for your good-humored confidence. You poor blinded wife. I have my own reasons for wishing to tear the mask off both their faces. It is not from goodwill to you that I so act, for I can easily imagine that this detection of two persons dear to you may bring you more pain than profit, but I have no good will to you in my heart. Perhaps I am a rejected adorer who is taking his revenge this way. What matters the motive? The fact is there, and if you wish for proofs, I can furnish them to you. Besides, without proofs, you would give no credit to an anonymous letter. The accompanying billet was lost by Countess Gurr. This astounding letter lay on our breakfast table one fine spring morning. Frederick was sitting opposite to me, busied with his letters, while I read and reread the above ten times over. The note, which accompanied the traitor's epistle, was enclosed in an envelope of its own, and I put off tearing it open. I looked at Frederick. He was deep in a morning paper. Still, he must have felt the look which I fixed on him, for he let the newspaper fall, and with his usual kindly, smiling expression, turned his face to me. "'Hello, what is the matter, Martha? Why are you staring at me in that way?' I wanted to know whether you are still fond of me. Oh, no, not for a long time, he said, jestingly. Really, I have never been able to bear you. That I do not believe. But now I begin to see. But you are quite pale. Have you had any bad news? I hesitated. Should I show him the letter? Should I first look at the piece of evidence which I held in my hand still unbroken? The thoughts whirled through my head. My Frederick, my all, my friend and husband, him whom I trusted and loved, could he be lost to me? Unfaithful he? Oh, it must have been only a momentary intoxication of the senses. Nothing more. Was there not enough indulgence in my heart to forgive it? To forget it? To regard it as having never happened? But to be false? How would it be? If his heart, too, had turned from me, how, if he preferred the seductive lorry to me? Well, do speak. You seem quite to have lost your voice. Show me the letter which has so shocked you. And he stretched his hand out for it. There it is for you. I gave him the letter I had just read. The enclosure I kept back. He glanced over the informer's writing. With an angry curse, he crumpled up the paper and sprang from his seat. Infamous, he cried, and where is the proof he speaks of? Here, not opened. Frederick, say one word only, and I throw the thing into the fire. I do not want to see any proofs that you have betrayed me. Oh, my own one! He was now by my side and embraced me closely. My treasure! Look into my eyes! Do you doubt me? Proof or no proof, is my word enough for you? Yes, I said, and threw the paper into the fire. But it did not fall into the flames, but remained close to the bars. Frederick jumped up to get it, and picked it out. No, no, we must not destroy that. I am too curious. We will look at it together. I do not recollect ever writing anything to your friend which could lead to the inference of a relation which does not exist. But you have smitten her, Frederick. You have only to throw your handkerchief to her. Do you think so? Come, let us look at this document. Write, my own hand. Oh, look here. It is surely the two lines which you dictated to me some weeks back, when you had hurt your right hand. My lorry. Come, 
I am anxiously expecting you today at 5 p.m. Martha, still a cripple. The finder of this note did not understand the meaning of the parenthesis. This is really a funny confusion. Thank God that this grand proof was not burned. Now my innocence is plain. Or have you still any suspicion? No. After you had looked in my face, I had no more. Do you know, Frederick, I should have been very unhappy, but I should have forgiven you? Laurie is coquettish, very pretty. Tell me, has not she made advances to you? You shake your head. Well, truly, in this matter, you have not only the right, but almost the duty of deceiving even me. A man cannot betray a lady's favor whether he accepts or rejects it. And so you would have forgiven me a false step? Are you not jealous? Yes, in a way that tears my heart. If I think of you at another's feet, sipping joy from another's lips, grown cold to me, all desire dead, it is horrible to me. Yet, it was not the death of your love that I feared. Your heart would under no circumstances turn cold to me, that I am sure of. Our souls are surely so interwoven with each other. But, I understand. But you need, by no means, think of me, that my feeling for you is like that of a husband after the silver wedding. We have been married too short a time for that. So long as the fire of youth glows in me, for indeed I am forty years old already, it burns for you. You are the only woman on earth to me. And, should some other temptation in reality again assail me, my will is quite strong enough to keep it away from me. The happiness which is contained in the consciousness of having kept one's plighted troth, the proud repose of conscience with which a man can say of himself that he has kept the firmly tied bond of his life in every respect sacred, all this is to me too noble to allow it to be destroyed by a passing intoxication of the senses. You have besides made so perfectly happy a man of me, my Martha, that I am raised as far above everything, above all intoxication, all amusement, all pleasure, as the possessor of ingots of gold above the gain of copper pieces. With what delight did such words as these sink into my heart? I was expressly thankful to the anonymous letter-writer for helping me to this delightful scene, and I transferred every word into my red book. I can still reproduce the entry here, under date 1 4 Ah, how far, how far back is all that? Frederick, on the contrary, was highly incensed against the slanderer. He swore that he would find out who had been guilty of the composition, so as to punish the actor as he deserved. I found out the same day what the origin and aim of the writing was. Its result, which was that Frederick and I were thenceforth drawn a little closer together, its originator could hardly have foreseen. In the afternoon I went to my friend Lori to show her the letter. I wanted to let her know that she had an enemy by whom she was falsely exposed to suspicion, and I wanted to laugh with her over the chance that my dictated note had been so misconstrued. She laughed more than I expected. So you were shocked at the letter? Yes, mortally, and yet I had nearly burned the enclosed note. Oh, then the whole joke would have missed fire. What joke? You would have believed, to the end, that I had really betrayed you. Let me take this opportunity to make you a confession that I did in an hour of delirium. It was after the dinner at your father's at which I sat next to Tilling, and it was because I had drunk too much champagne that I did then, so to say, offer him my heart on a salver. And he? And he answered me very much to the purpose that he loved you above all other things and was firmly resolved to remain true to you, to death. The whole joke was contrived to teach you to prize this phenomenon better. What is this joke that you keep talking of? Why, you must know, inasmuch as the letter and the envelope come from me. From you? I know nothing about it. Have you then not turned the enclosure round? See here, 
On the back of it is written my name and the date. April 1. End of section 34. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Section 35 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 9. Part 1. The Indefinite Approximation of Two Loving Hearts. A Serious Illness. Progress of Conrad's Suit to My Sister. Aunt Mary's Letter. First Rumors of War with Prussia. Sequel of the Schleswig-Holstein War. The Poor Parlors and Negotiations Leading to the Austro-Prussian War. Arguments with my father and aunt about war. New Year's Day, 1866. Conrad and Lily engaged. My father's toast. War visibly approaching. Hopes and fears. Recriminations and reciprocal provocations. Prussia occupies Holstein. The army of the Bund mobilized. War declared. Manifestos of the sovereigns and generals. Brought nearer, ever nearer. I have found out that this capacity of approximation of loving hearts belongs to the class of things of which divisibility is an example. Things which have no limits. One might have believed that a particle might have become so small already that nothing smaller could be conceived, and yet it is susceptible of division into two halves. And so one might think that two hearts might be already so fused together that a more intimate union could not be possible, and yet some external influence acts, and the atoms, the two hearts, embrace and interpenetrate each other still more firmly and closer, ever closer. This was the effect of Laurie's sufficiently tasteless April fooling, and such was the effect of another external event which happened soon after, that is, a violent nervous fever which attacked me and laid me on a sickbed for six weeks. It was indeed a sad event, and yet how fruitful it was in happy recollections for me, and how powerful in its influence on the process sketched above. I mean, the bringing nearer and nearer of to so closely attached hearts, whether it was the fear of losing me, which made me still dearer to my husband, or whether it was that his love had merely become more noticeable to me by his behavior as sick nurse. In short, during this nervous fever, and after it, I still more and still more surely felt that I was beloved than before. I was also truly afraid of dying, first because it would have given me horrible pain to lose a life which seemed to me so rich in beauty and happiness, and to leave my dear ones. Frederick, with whom I wished so much to grow to old age, Rudolf, whom I wished so much to train up to manhood, and secondly, too, not in respect to myself, but with regard to Frederick, the thought of death was horrible to me because I knew as well as one can know anything that the pain of laying me in the grave would be, to the bereaved one, well nigh intolerable. No, no, people who are happy, and people who are beloved by those they hold dear, cannot feel any contempt for death. The chief ingredient in the latter is contempt for life. On my sickbed, where sickness buzzed around me with its deadly power, as the warrior on the battlefield hears the buzz of those bullets around him, I was able to enter perfectly into the feelings of those soldiers who love their lives and who know that their death will plunge hearts they love into despair. There is but one thing, said Frederick in reply to me when I communicated this thought to him, in which the soldier has the advantage over the fever patient, the consciousness of duty fulfilled. Still, I agree with you in this, to die with indifference, to die with joy, as we are on all hands told to do is what no happy man can do. Only those could who were exposed in former times to all the ills of life, or those who have nothing left to lose in a peaceful existence, or such as can only free their brethren from shame and an intolerable yoke by their own death. When the danger was over, 
How I enjoyed my recovery, my new birth. That was a feast for both of us, like the happiness of our reunion after the Schleswig-Holstein War, but still different. Then the joy came with a single stroke, and here, little by little. And besides, since that time, we were closer to each other, ever closer. My father had visited me daily during my illness, and shown much concern, but for all that I knew that he would not have taken my death to heart overwhelmingly. He was much more attached to his two younger daughters than to me, and the dearest of all to him was Otto. I had become to some extent estranged from him by my two marriages, and particularly by the second, and perhaps also by my totally different way of thinking. When I was completely recovered, which was in the middle of June, he removed to Grumitz, and gave me a warm invitation to come to him there with my little Rudolph. But I preferred, since Frederick was prevented from leaving the city by his duties, to take my country holiday quite close to Vienna, where my husband could visit me daily, and so I hired a summer lodging at Hietzing. My sisters, still under Aunt Mary's protection, traveled to Marienbad. In her last letter from Prague, Lily wrote to me as follows, amongst other matters, I must confess to you that Cousin Conrad begins to be by no means displeasing to me. During several cotillions I was in the humor to have said yes, if he had put the important question, but he omitted to take the decisive step at the right moment. When it was settled that we were to leave the city, he did, it is true, make me an offer again, but then I had again an impulse to refuse— I have become so used to do this to poor Conrad that when he used the accustomed form to me, will you not now become my wife, Lily? My tongue replied quite automatically. I have no idea of doing so. But this time, I added, ask me again in six months. That means that I am going to examine my heart during the summer. If I long after him in his absence, if the thought of him, which now follows me almost uninterruptedly day and night, does not quit me when I am at Marienbad, if neither there nor in the ensuing shooting season any other man succeeds in making an impression on me, why then the perseverance of my obstinate cousin will have prevailed. Aunt Mary wrote to me about the same time. This happens to be the only letter of hers which I have kept. My dear child, this has been a fatiguing winter campaign. I shall be not a little glad when Rosa and Lily have found partners. Found they have, plenty of them, for as you know each has refused, in the course of the carnival, half a dozen offers, not counting the perennial Conrad. Now the same drudgery is to begin again at Marienbad. I should like to have gone to Grumitz to spend some time, above all things, or to you, and instead of this I am obliged to play over again the tiresome and thankless part of chaperone to these pleasure-seeking girls. I am very glad to hear that you are quite well again. Now that the danger is over— I may say that we were in great trouble. Your husband used for some time to write us such despairing letters. Every moment he was in fear of seeing you die. But let us thank God that it was not destined so to be. The novena which you kept at the Ursulines for your recovery also perhaps helped to preserve you. The Almighty designed to spare you for your little Rudy. Kiss the dear little boy and tell him to keep hard at his learning. I send him with this a couple of little books the pious child and his guardian angel, a charming story, and our country's heroes, a collection of war sketches for boys. A taste for such things cannot be instilled too early into the young. Your brother Otto, for instance, was not five years old when I used to tell him about Alexander the Great and Caesar and other famous conquerors, and it is a real pleasure to see what a spirit he has now for everything heroic. I have heard that you prefer to remain for the summer in the neighborhood of Vienna, instead of going to Grumitz. You are quite wrong there. The air of Grumitz would suit you much better than that dusty heatsing, and poor Papa will be quite bored all alone. Probably it is on your husband's account that you will not go away, but it seems to me that the duty of a daughter also should not be quite neglected. Tilling, too, could surely come to Grumitz for a day sometimes. To be so very much together is not altogether good for married folks. Trust my experience of life. I have noticed that the best marriages are those in which the couples are not always sitting, prosing together, but allow each other a little latitude. Now goodbye. Spare yourself, so as not to get a relapse, and think again about Heatsing. May heaven preserve you and your Rudy. This is the constant prayer of your affectionate 
Aunt Mary. P.S. Your husband has, I know, relatives in Prussia. Happily, he is not so arrogant as his countrymen. So ask him what they are saying there about the political situation. It is surely very grave. This letter of my aunt made me reflect again that there was a political situation. During all this time, I had not troubled myself about anything of the sort. I had, it is true, read a good deal both before and after my illness, as usual, daily and weekly papers, reviews, and books, but the leading articles in the journals remained unnoticed. Since I no longer debated with myself the anxious question, war or no war, the chatter about home and foreign politics possessed no interest for me. The postscript of the letter quoted above looked serious, and it occurred to me to look up what I had neglected and inform myself about our present position. What does Aunt Mary mean by her expression threatening, you least arrogant among the Prussians? I asked my husband, as I gave him the letter to read. Is there then a political situation at the present time? There is one, as there is weather, always, more's a pity, and one is always as changeable and treacherous as the other. Well, tell me then, are they talking still about these complicated duchies? Have they not done with them yet? They are talking about them more than ever. They have not done with them in the least. The Schleswig-Holsteiners have now a great fancy to get free of the Prussians, the arrogant Prussians we are called in the latest form of speech. Sooner Danish than Prussians, say they, repeating a signal given them by the central states. Do you note that the hackneyed Miramschlungen song is now sung with this variation? Schleswig-Holstein Stammverwand schmeißt die Prussen aus dem Land. And what has happened to the Augustenberg? Have they got him then? Oh, do not tell me, Frederick, do not tell me that they have not got him. It was on account of this, the only rightful heir for whom the poor countries oppressed by the Danes were longing so that the whole war had to be waged which might have cost me you. Leave me then at least the consolation that this indispensable Augustenberg has been reinstated in his rights and is reigning over the undivided duchies. I take my stand on this word undivided. It is an old historical right which has been assured to them for several centuries, and the foundation of which I had trouble enough in investigating. It is going badly with your historical rights, my poor Martha, said Frederick, laughing. No one says anything at all about Augustenburg now, except himself and his protests and manifestos. From this time I began again to look into the political complications and found out as follows. Absolutely nothing had really been settled or recognized, in spite of the protocol signed at the time of the Peace of Vienna. Since that, the Schleswig-Holstein question had been brought into all sorts of stages, but now was debated more than ever. The Augustenburg and the Oldenburg had made haste since the abdication which had taken place on the part of Lagusburg to make reclamation before the assembly of the Bund and Lauenburg was eagerly desirous to be incorporated in the kingdom of Prussia. No one knows exactly what the Allies were going to try to do with conquered provinces. Each of these two powers attributed to the other a design of overreaching the other. End of section 35。section 36 of Lay Down Your Arms。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 9, Part 2 What is this Prussia up to now? Such was the question, indicating mischief, which Austria, the Central States, and the Duchies kept always asking. Napoleon III advised Prussia to annex the duchies up to North Schleswig, where they speak Danish, but Prussia was not thinking of that for the moment. At last, on February 22, 1865, her claims were formulated to this effect. Prussian troops to remain in the countries, the latter to put their defensive forces under Prussian leadership, with the exception of a contingent of troops of the Bund, the harbor of Kiel to be occupied, posts and telegraphs to be Prussian, and the duchies to be compelled to join the Tolverein. Of these demands, our minister, Mensdorf Puli, complained, I do not know why, 
and still further, again I have no why, presumably out of envy, that distinctive feature in the conduct of external relations, the central states complained also. They vehemently demanded that the Augustenburg should, with all speed, be at once inducted into the government of the duchies. Austria, however, had something to say also, and what she said was this. She treated the Augustenburg as non-existent, was willing to consent to the possession by Prussia of the Kiel Harbor, but stood out against the right of recruiting and pressing sailors. And so the quarrel went on without cessation. Prussia declared that her demands were made only in the interests of Germany, that she did not wish for annexation. Augustenburg might enter on his inheritance, if he accepted the demands laid down, but if these necessary and moderate claims were not granted, then, with voice raised to the pitch of threatening, perhaps she would be compelled to demand more. Against this menacing voice, other voices were raised in scorn, in mockery, in provocation. In the central states and in Austria, public opinion became daily more and more embittered against Prussia, and especially against Bismarck. On June 27, the central states accepted a motion to request information from the great powers. But as giving information is not the habit of diplomacy, but keeping everything snug and secret, the great powers negotiated in private. King William traveled to Gastein, the Emperor Francis Joseph to Ischel, Count Bloma fitted hither and thither between them, and an agreement was arrived at, on certain points. The occupation was to be half Austrian and half Prussian. Lauenburg, according to her own wish, was to be united to Prussia. For this, Austria was to receive as compensation two and a half millions of dollars. This last result was not calculated to inspire me with patriotic joy. What good could this insignificant sum do to the thirty-six millions of Austrians, even if it was to be divided among them, which was not the case? Would it replace the hundreds of thousands which, for example, I had lost with Schmidt and Sons? Or, still more, the losses of those who were mourning for their dear ones? What pleased me was a treaty which was signed at Gastein on August 14th. Treaty. The word sounds so promising of peace. It was not till afterwards that I learned that international treaties very often only serve, by means of importune violations of them, to introduce what is called casus belli. Then it is only necessary for one party to charge the other with a breach of treaty, and immediately the swords spring out of their sheaths, with all the appearance of a defense of violated rights. Still, the Gastein Treaty brought me repose. The quarrel seemed to be laid aside. General Goblins, handsome General Goblins, for whom all we ladies had a slight pension, the Stadtholder in Holstein, Manteuffel in Schleswig. I had at last to give up my favorite security, enacted in the year 1460, that the countries should remain together, forever undivided. As far as concerned my Augustenburg, for whose rights I had with so much trouble got up some warmth, it happened that this prince went on one occasion into his country and received the homage of his adherents, on which Monteufel signified to him that if he ever ventured to come into those parts again without permission, he would unquestionably have him arrested. Whoever cannot see in that a good joke of Muse Cleo's can have no comprehension of the comicalities of history. In spite of the Gastein Treaty, the situation would not calm down. And as I now, being alarmed by Aunt Mary's letter, and the explanations of it, which I received, resumed the regular perusal of the political leading articles, and collected intelligence from all sides about the opinions which gained currency, I was in a position to follow once more, with accuracy, the phases of the varying strife. That the latter would lead to a war, I did not apprehend. Such legal questions would have to be brought to an issue in the legal way, that is, by weighing the claim of right on the two sides, and by a sentence consequent on this. All these consultative meetings of ministers and assemblies, these negotiating statesmen and monarch in friendly intercourse, would surely settle the debated points, which were in themselves so trivial. It was with more curiosity than anxiety that I followed the course of this incident, the different stages of which I find noted in my red volumes. 
October 1, 1865. In the assemblage of delegates at Frankfurt, the following conclusions were accepted. 1. The right of the people of Schleswig-Holstein to decide on their own destiny remains in force. The Gastein Treaty is rejected by the nation as a breach of right. 2. All representatives of the people are to refuse all taxes and expenses to such governments as assert the policy of violence hitherto followed. October 15. The Prussian Crown Syndic gave his judgment on the hereditary rights of Prince Augustenberg. The father of the latter had renounced for himself and his posterity his succession to the throne for a sum of one and a half million of specie dollars. The duchies were surrendered in the Treaty of Vienna. The Augustenberg had no claims at all upon them. In impudence, in assumption, such were the terms applied to this speech delivered at Berlin, and the arrogance of Prussia became a catchword. We must protect ourselves against it, was accepted as dogma of all kinds. King William seems disposed to play the part of the German Victor Emmanuel. Austria's secret motives to reconquer Silesia. Prussia is paying court to France. Austria is paying court to France. It patati, it patata, as the French say. Trich trotch is the German name for it and it does not go on more busily in the coffee-house coteries of country towns than between the cabinets of great powers. The winter brought my whole family back to Vienna. Rosa and Lily had amused themselves very much in the Bohemian watering places, but neither was engaged. Conrad's affairs were in an excellent way. In the shooting season he was to come to Grumitz, and, although at this crisis the decisive word had not yet been spoken, Still, both were inwardly convinced that they would end in being united. Neither at this autumn shooting season did I make my appearance, in spite of my father's pressing persuasions. Frederick could not get any leave, and to separate from him was to exist in such sorrow as I would not expose myself to, without necessity. A second reason for not passing any length of time at my father's was that I did not wish to expose my little Rudolph to his grandfather's influence, whose effort always was to inspire the child with military tastes. The inclination for this calling, to which I was thoroughly averse as a profession for my son, had been awakened in him without this. Probably it was in his blood. The scion of a long race of soldiers must, by nature, bring warlike instincts into the world with him. In the works on natural science, whose study we were now pursuing more eagerly than ever, I had learned about the power of heredity of the existence of so-called congenital instincts, which are nothing but the impulse to put in action the customs handed down from our ancestors. On the boy's birthday, the grandfather was careful to bring him again a saber. But you know, father, I remonstrated, that my son will certainly not become a soldier, and I must really beg you seriously. What, do you want him to tie to his mother's apron strings? I hope you will not succeed there. Good soldier's blood is no liar. Let the fellow only grow up, and he will soon choose his profession for himself, and there is no finer one than that which you want to forbid him. Martha is frightened, said Aunt Mary, who was present at this conversation, of exposing her only son to danger. But she forgets that if one is destined to die, the fate will overtake one in one's bed, as surely as in battle. Then suppose one hundred thousand men to have fallen in war. They would have all been killed in peace, too? Aunt Mary was not at a loss for an answer. It was the destiny of these one hundred thousand to die in war. But if men had the sense not to begin any war, I suggested. Oh, but that is an impossibility, cried my father. And then the conversation turned again into a controversy such as my father and I used to often wage, and always on the same lines. On the one side, the same assertions and principles. On the other, the same counter-assertions and opposite principles. There is nothing to which the fable of the Hydra is so applicable as to some standing difference of opinion. No sooner have you cut one head off the argument and settled yourself to send the second the same way, when, lo, the first has grown again. Thus my father had one or two favorite positions in favor of war, which nothing could uproot. One. Wars are ordained by God himself. The Lord of hosts, see the Holy Scriptures. 2. There have always been wars, and, consequently, 
there will always be wars. 3. Mankind, without this occasional decimation, would increase at too great a rate. 4. Continual peace relaxes, effeminates, produces, like stagnant water, corruption, especially the degeneration of morals. 5. Wars are the best means for putting in practice self-sacrifice, heroism, in short, the firmer elements of character. 6. Men will always contend. Perfect agreement in all their views is impossible. Divergent interests must be always impinging on each other. Consequently, everlasting peace is a contradiction in terms. None of these positions, in particular none of these consequentlies contained in them, could be kept standing if stoutly attacked, but each of them served the defender as a bulwark if compelled to let another of them fall, and while the new bulwark was being reduced to ruins, he had been setting the old one up again. For example, if the champion of war, driven into a corner, has to confess that peace is more worthy of humanity, more rich in blessing, more favorable to culture than war, he says, Oh yes, war is an evil, but it is inevitable. And then follows numbers one and two. Then if one shows that it could be avoided, and how, by alliances of states, arbitration courts, and so forth, then comes the reply, Oh yes, war could be avoided, but it ought not. And then comes number four and five. Then if the advocate of peace upsets these objections, and goes on to prove that, on the contrary, war hardens men and dehumanizes them, Oh yes, I allow that, but number three. This argument, too, is overthrown, for it is admitted that nature herself will see that the trees do not grow up to the sky, and wants no assistance from man to that end. This again turns out not to be the result which the professor of force has in view in making war. Granted, but number one. And so there is no end to the debate. The advocate of war is always in the right. His reasoning moves in a circle where you may always follow, but can never catch him. War is a horrible evil. It must exist. I grant it is not a necessity, but it is a great good. This want of consecutiveness, of logical honesty, all those people incur who defend a cause on principles which are not axiomatic, or else with no principles, merely from instinct, and to that end, will make use of all such phrases or commonplaces as may have come to their ears, and which have obtained currency in the maintenance of that cause. That these arguments do not proceed from the same points of view, that accordingly they not only do not support each other, but even do directly neutralize each other, makes no matter to them. It is not because this or that reasoning has originated from their own reflections, or is in harmony with their own convictions that it comes into their train of argument, they merely use to bolster the latter up, without any selection, the conclusions which others have thought out. All this might not have been so clear to me at that time when I was disputing with my father on the topic of peace and war. It was not till later on that I had accustomed myself to follow, with attention, the movements of the intellect in my own and other people's heads. I only recollect that I will always come away from these discussions in the highest degree fatigued and excited, and now see that this fatigue proceeded from this pursuing in a circle which my father's way of argument necessitated. This conclusion was, however, every time a compassionate shrug of the shoulders on his part, with the words, you do not understand that. Words which, as he was treating of military matters, sounded certainly very well deserved in the mouth of an old general as addressed to a young lady. End of section 36. Section 37 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 9, Part 3. New Year's Day, 1866. We were all sitting with our punch and New Year's cakes 
assembled round my father's table when the first hour of this eventful year struck. It was a cheerful feast. We celebrated an engagement at the end of the old year, Conrad and Lily's. As the hand pointed to twelve, and Fou du Joie was fired in the street, my enterprising cousin threw his arm around the young lady who was sitting beside him, pressed, to the surprise of us all, a kiss on her lips, and then asked, Will you take me in sixty-six? Yes, I will, she replied, and I love you, Conrad. Then followed on all hands a clinking of glasses, embracing, handshaking, felicitations, and blessings without end. The health of the lovers. Long live Conrad and Lily. God bless your union, my children. Heartfelt congratulations, cousin. Happiness to you, sister. And so on and so on. A joyful and peaceful frame of mind took possession of us all. Perhaps not quite free of envy and all, for as death represents the most mournful and most lamentable of events, so love, the love which is sanctioned by the life-giving union, is the most joyful and the most enviable. I indeed could detect no trace of envy in myself, for happiness which had only just become a promise to the new bride had long since been my actual and firm possession. It was rather a feeling of doubt that crept over me. Such perfect bliss, as was prepared for me by Frederick, can hardly fall to poor Lily's lot. Conrad is, it is true, a very amiable man, but there is but one Frederick. My father brought to an end the tumult of congratulations by tapping on his glass with the signet ring on his little finger and rising to speak. He spoke somewhat to this effect. My dear children and friends, the year 66 begins well. To me it is bringing in its very first hour the fulfillment of a cherished wish, for I have long looked forward to having Conrad for my son-in-law. Let us hope that this prosperous year may also bring our Rosa under the yoke. And to you, Martha, and Tilling, a visit from the stork. To you, Dr. Bresser, may it bring many patients, though this as far as I can see hardly goes with the many wishes for good health that we have all been exchanging. And to you, dear Mary, may it present, that is, provide that it has been destined for you, for I know and honor your fatalism, a pitched battle of plenary indulgence or whatever it is that you are wishing for. You, my Otto, may it endow with eminent distinction in your final examination, and with all possible soldierly virtues and acquirements, so that you may one day become the ornament of the army and pride of your old father. And to the latter also I must try and get something good to come. And since he is one who knows no higher wish than for the good and the glory of Austria, I hope the coming year may bring some great conquest to the country. Lombardy, or who knows, the province of Silesia. One cannot tell to what all this is preliminary, but it is by no means impossible that we may take back again from the insolent Prussians that country which was stolen from the great Maria Theresa. I recollect that the close of my father's toast threw a chill on us. Lombardy and Silesia? Truly, None of us felt any pressing need for them. And the underlying wish for war, that is, fresh lamentation, more death pangs, that surely did not accord with the tender joyfulness which this hour, made sacred by a new bond of love, had awakened in our hearts. I even permitted myself to reply, No, dear father, today is the new year for the Italians, and Prussians also so we will not wish any destruction for them. May all men in the year 66, and in the years that are to follow, grow more united and more happy. My father shrugged his shoulders. You enthusiast, said he pityingly. Not at all, said Frederick in my defense. The wish expressed by Martha has no taint of enthusiasm, for its fulfillment is assured to us by science. Better and more united and more happy are men constantly becoming, from the beginning of all things to the present day, but so imperceptibly, so slowly, that a little span of time, like a year, may not show any visible progress. If you believe so firmly in everlasting progress, remarked my father, why are you so often complaining about reaction? 
about relapse into barbarism. Because, Frederick took out a pencil and drew a spiral on a sheet of paper, because the march of civilization is something like this. Does not this line, in spite of its occasional twist backwards, always move steadily onwards? The year which is commencing may, it is true, represent a twist, especially if it seems likely another war is going to be waged. Anything of that sort pushes culture a long way back, in every aspect, material as well as moral. You are not talking much like a soldier, my dear Telling. I am talking, my dear father-in-law, of a general proposition. My view about this may be true or false. Whether it is soldierly or not is another question. At any rate, truth can only be, in any matter, one way. If a thing is red, shouldn't one man call it blue on principle because he wears a blue uniform? and black if he wears a black cowl? A what? My father was in the habit, if any discussion did not go quite as he liked, to affect a little difficulty of hearing. To reply to such a what by repeating the whole sentence was what few people had the patience to do, and the best way was to give up the argument. Afterwards, the same night when we had got home, I put my husband under examination. What was that you said to my father? that there was every appearance that there would be another fight this year. I will not have you go into another war. I will not have it. What is the use, dear Martha, of this passionate I will not? You would certainly be the first to withdraw it in the face of facts, by how much more visibly war stands at the gate, by so much more the impossible would it be for me to apply for my discharge. Immediately after Schleswig-Holstein it might have been feasible. Ah, that unlucky Schmidt and Sons! But now, when the new clouds are gathering, then you really believe that? I believe that these clouds will disperse again. The two great powers will not tear each other to pieces for those northern countries. But now that it seems threatening again, retirement would have a cowardly look. You must see that, too. I was obliged to be guided by this reasoning, but I clung to the hopeful phrase, these clouds will disperse again. I now followed with anxiety the development of political events, and the opinions and prophecies about them that were current in the newspapers and public speeches. Be prepared, be prepared, was the cry now. Prussia is silently preparing. Austria is silently preparing. The Prussians assert that we are preparing, and it is not true. It is they who are preparing. You lie. No, it is not true that we are preparing. If they prepare, we must prepare also. If we leave off our preparations, who knows if they will? And so the note of preparation sounded in my ear in all possible variations. But then, what is all this clang of arms for if one is not to take them in hand? I asked, to which my father answered in the old phrase, Sivis bachem, parabellum. We, that is, are only preparing out of precaution. And the other side? With a view of attacking us. But they also are saying that their action is only a precaution against our attack. That is malice. And they say that we are malicious. Oh, they say that only as a pretext, to be better able to make their preparations. So again, in endless circle, a serpent with his tail in his mouth, whose upper and lower end is a double dishonesty. It is only by producing an impression on an enemy who desires war that the method of fighting him, by preparations, can be effective on the side of peace. But two equal powers, both desirous of peace, cannot possibly act on that system, unless each is firmly persuaded that the other is deceiving him with hollow phrases. And this persuasion becomes the more firm the more one knows that one is oneself hiding the same views as one charges on one's adversary under similar phrases. It is not only the augurs. The diplomatists also know well enough about each other, what each has in mind behind the public ceremonies and modes of speech. The preparation for war lasted on both sides during the early months of the year. On March 12th, my father burst into my room, radiant with joy. Hurrah, he shouted, good news. Disarmament? I asked, delighted. What for? On the contrary, this is the good news. Yesterday, a great council of war was held. It was really splendid. What an armed power we are masters of. The arrogant Prussians had best take care. 
we are prepared any hour to take the field with 800,000 men. And Benedek, our best strategist, is to be commander-in-chief with unlimited power. I say this to you, my child, in confidence. Silesia is ours whenever we choose. Oh, God. Oh, God, I groaned. Must this scourge come on us once more? Who, who can be so devoid of conscience as from ambition, from greed of territory? Calm yourself. We are not so ambitious, nor are we greedy of territory. What we desire, that is to say, not I exactly, for to me it would be quite the right thing to get our own Silesia back again, but what the government desire is to keep peace. That they have asserted often enough. And the enormous strength of our active army, as it comes out in the communication yesterday, made to the council of war by the emperor, will inspire all other powers with due respect. Prussia, to begin with, will certainly sing small, and leave off trying to speak in a commanding tone. Thank God. We shall have our say in Schleswig holstein too, and I am sure we shall never endure that the other great power should, by too great an extension of its dominion, conquer itself a preponderance in Germany. That is a matter which touches our honor, our prestige, as the French call it, perhaps our existence. But you cannot understand it. The whole affair is a contest for hegemony. The miserable Schleswig is the last thing in it. But this splendid council of war has shown plainly which takes the first place and which is to dictate conditions to the other, the successors of the little electors of Brandenburg or those of the long line of Romano-German emperors. I consider peace as certain. But if the others are going on still, to behave themselves in an impudent and arrogant way, and so to make war inevitable, then our victory is assured, and with it, conquests are absolutely incalculable. It were to be wished that it would break out. Oh, yes, and you do wish it too, father, and the whole council of war seems to be with you. Then I should like it better if you said it out plainly. Only do not let us have this falsehood, this assurance to the people and the friends of peace, that all this purchasing of weapons and demands for war credits are only for the purpose of your beloved peace. If you are already showing your teeth and closing your fists, do not whisper soft words all the while. If you are trembling with impatience to draw the sword, do not make believe that it is only from the precaution that you are laying your hand on the hilt. So I went on talking for a while, with trembling voice and rising passion, while my father was too much taken aback to answer a word, and at last I ended by bursting into tears. End of section 37. Section 38 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner. Translated by Timothy Holmes. Chapter 9, Part 4. Now followed a time of fluctuating hopes and fears. Today it was peace is secure, tomorrow war inevitable. But persons were of the latter view. Not so much because the situation pointed to a bloody arbitrament, but on this account that if once the word war has been pronounced, there may be a good deal of debating one way and the other, but experience shows that the end always is war. The little invisible egg which contains the Cassis Belli is brooded over so long that at last the monster creeps out of it. Daily did I note in the red volumes the phases of the varying strife, and thus I knew at that time, and still know today, how the eventful War of 66 was prepared, and how it broke out. Without these entries I might easily find myself in the same ignorance about this precise piece of history as most men are who live where history is being played out. The great majority of the people usually know nothing about why or how a war exists. They only see it coming for a certain time, and then it is there. And when it is there, people make no more inquiries about the petty interests and differences of opinion which brought it about, but are then only busied with the mighty events to which its progress gives birth. And when it is over at last, what one remembers chiefly are the terrors and losses 
we have personally experienced, the conquests and triumphs that have marked its course. But on the political grounds for its origin, no one wastes the thought. In the many works of history, which appear after every campaign under the title of The War of the Year So-and-So Historically and Strategically Described, or something to that effect, all the old motives for the strife and all the tactical movements of the campaign in question are recounted, and anyone who takes an interest in such things can pick out the explanation from the literature in which it is wrapped up, but in the remembrance of the people. Such histories certainly do not live. Even of the feelings of hatred and enthusiasm, of embitterment and hope of victory, with which the whole population greets the commencement of the war, feelings expressed in the common, saying, this is a very popular war. Even of these feelings, all was wiped out after a year or two. On March 24th, Prussia issued a circular note in which he complained of the threatening preparations of Austria then why do we not disarm if we do not wish to threaten? Why, how can we? For on March 28th, you see it is enacted on the side of Prussia that the fortresses in Silesia and the two corps d'armée are to be put on a war footing. March 31st. Thank God, Austria declares that all the rumors in circulation about her secret preparations are false. It has never even entered into her head to attack Prussia. And on this she founds the demand that Prussia shall suspend her measures of warlike preparation. Prussia replies that she has not the remotest idea of attacking Austria, but that it has become compulsory, in consequence of the late preparations, to be prepared for attack. And so the responsive song of the two voices goes on without pause. My preparations are defensive. Your preparations are offensive. I must prepare because you are preparing. I am preparing because you prepare. Then let us prepare. Yes, let us go on preparing. The newspapers give the orchestral accompaniments to this duet. The leading articles revel in what is called conjectural politics. It was all poking up, baiting, bragging, slandering. Historical works on the Seven Years' War were published with the avowed intention of renewing the old enmity. Meanwhile, the exchanges of notes went on. In that of April 7, Austria again officially denied her preparations, but laid stress on an oral expression, said to have been used by Bismarck to Count Caroli, that it would be easy to disregard the Gastein Treaty. Must then the destiny of nations depend on anything that the two noble diplomatists may have said to one another in more or less good humor about treaties? And what kind of treaties can those be, after all, whose contents remain dependent on the goodwill of the contracting parties, and are not assured by any higher court or arbitration? Prussia answered this note on April 15, that the charge was untrue, but she was obliged to persist in asserting that Austria had really made preparations on the frontier, and on this she founded the justification of her own preparations. If Austria were in earnest about not attacking, she would first disarm. To this, the Vienna cabinet replied, We will disarm on the 25th of this month, if Prussia promises to do the same on the following day. Prussia declared herself ready. What a breathing again. So then, in spite of all threatening signs, peace will be preserved. I noted this change joyfully in the Red Book. But prematurely. New complications arose. Austria declared that she could only disarm in the north, but not in the south at the same time, since she was threatened in that quarter by Italy. To which Prussia replied, If Austria does not disarm altogether, we shall also remain in a state of preparation. Now Italy expressed herself to the effect that it had never, in the faintest way, entered into her mind to attack Austria, but that after this last declaration she was under the necessity of at least making counter-preparations. And so this charming song of defense was now sung by three voices. I allowed myself to be again in a measure lulled to sleep by this melody. After such loud and repeated protestations, neither surely can attack, and unless one of them attack, there can be no war. The principle that it is only defensive wars that can be justified 
has now taken such firm possession of the public conscience that surely no government can any more undertake an invasion of a neighboring country. And if none but mere defensive troops are ranged opposite each other, however threatening their armies are, however determined they may be to defend themselves to the knife, still they cannot actually break the peace. What a delusion! Beside the offensive, there are, I find, many other ways of commencing hostilities. There are demands and interventions regarding some small third country and which have to be resisted as unfair. There are old treaties which are declared to be violated, and for the upholding of which recourse must be had to arms. And finally there is the European equilibrium, which would be endangered by the acquisition of power by one state or the other. And so energetic steps are demanded to prevent such acquisition. It is not avowed, but one of the most violent impulses to fight is the hate which has long been stirred up, and which at last presses on to the death-dealing combat as ardently and with the same natural force as long-cherished love to the life-giving embrace. Events now began to tread on each other's heels. Austria declared for the Augustenberg so decisively that Prussia characterized it as a breach of the Gastein Treaty and discovered in that a plainly hostile intention, the consequence of which was that the preparations on both sides were carried to their highest point. And now Saxony also began to do the same. The excitement was universal and became more violent every day. War in sight, war in sight, was the announcement of every newspaper and every speech. I felt as if I were at sea and a storm approaching. The most hated and most reviled man in Europe, then, was called Bismarck. On May 7th, an attempt was made to assassinate him. Did Blind, the perpetrator of the deed, wish to avert this storm? And would he have averted it? I received letters from Prussia, from Aunt Cornelia, from which it seemed that in that country the war was anything but desired while with us there prevailed universal enthusiasm for the idea of a war with Prussia, and we looked with pride on our million of picked soldiers. Inward contention reigned there. Bismarck was no less reviled and slandered in his own country than in ours. The report went that the land there would refuse to go out to the fraternal war, and it was said that Queen Augusta threw herself at her husband's feet to pray for peace. Oh, how glad should I have been to kneel at her side, and how gladly would I have hurried off all my sister-women, yes, all, to do the same. It is this and this alone that should be the effort of all women. Peace. Peace. Lay down your arms. If our beautiful empress had also thrown herself at her husband's feet, and with tears and lifted hands had begged for disarmament, who knows? Perhaps she did. Perhaps the emperor himself also wished to preserve peace but the pressure proceeding from the councils and the speakers and the shouting and the writing was such as no one man, even on the throne, could stand against. End of section 38. Section 39 of Lay Down Your Arms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lay Down Your Arms by Bertha von Suttner Translated by Timothy Holmes Chapter 9 Part 5 On June 1, Prussia declared to the Assembly of the Bund that she would at once disarm if Austria and Saxony set the example. Against that came a direct accusation from Vienna that Prussia had for a long time been planning, in concert with Italy, an attack on Austria, and on that account, the latter now desired to call the whole Bund to arms, in order to request it to undertake the decision of the case of the duchies. She desired at that same time to call the estates of Holstein to cooperate. Against this declaration, Prussia lodged a protest, inasmuch as it overturned the Gastein Treaty. That being so, the position reverted to the Vienna Treaty, that is, to the common condominium. The consequence was that Prussia had also the right to occupy Holstein, as on her side Austria was permitted to occupy Schleswig, and the Prussians at once moved into Holstein. Goblins withdrew without sword drawn, but under protest. Bismarck had previously said in a circular letter, 
we have found no disposition at all to meet us at Vienna. On the contrary, expressions have fallen from Austrian statesmen and counselors of the emperor, which have reached the ear of the king from authentic sources, church trash, and which prove that the ministers wish for war at any price, to wish for public slaughter, what a fearful accusation, partly because they hope for success in the field, partly to get free of internal difficulties and to eke out their own shattered finances by contributions from Prussia. Statecraft. The press was now completely warlike, and, of course, as the patriotic custom is, sure of victory. The possibility of defeat must be entirely left out of view by every loyal subject whom his prince summons to the battle. Numerous leading articles pictured Benedict's entry into Berlin and also the sack of that city by the Croats. Some even recommended to raise the capital of Prussia to the ground. Sack! Raise to the ground! Ride over spurs in blood! These are the expressions which do not indeed any longer express the popular conception in modern times of what is right. But they have, since the days of our school studies of the ancient histories of war, been always clinging to the people, and they have been so often recited in the histories of battles learned by heart, so often written down in our essays in German, that if a man has to write an article on the subject of war in a newspaper, such expressions drop from his pen spontaneously. Contempt for the enemy cannot be too strongly expressed. For the Prussian troops, the Vienna newspapers had no other term than the tailors. Adjutant General Count Grüner expressed himself thus, We shall chase off these Prussians with a flea in their ear. That is the kind of way to make a war quite popular. That sort of thing strengthens the national confidence. June 11. Austria proposes that the Bund shall take action against Prussia's helping herself in Holstein and mobilize the whole army of the Bund. On June 14th, this proposition is put to vote, and by nine votes to six, accepted. Oh, those three votes. How much grief and how much shrieks of pain have made groaning echo to those three votes. It is done. The ambassadors have received their dismissal. On the 16th, the Bund requested Austria and Bavaria to go to the assistance of the Hanoverians and Saxons, who were already attacked by Prussia. On the 18th, the Prussian War Manifesto appeared, and at the same time the Manifesto of the Emperor of Austria to his people, and the proclamation of Benedict to his troops. On the 22nd, Prince Frederick Charles published his orders to his army, and thus commenced the war. I copied the four original documents at the time. Here they are. King William says, Austria will not forget that her princes were once the rulers of Germany, and will not regard modern Prussia as a co-partner, but only as a hostile rival. Prussia, it is held, must be opposed in all her efforts, because whatever profits Prussia injures Austria. The old unblessed jealousy has again burst out into a fierce flame. Prussia is to be weakened, destroyed, disinherited. With her, no treaties are to be any longer in force. Wherever we look in Germany, we are surrounded by foes. And their war cry is humiliation for Prussia. Up to the last moment I have sought for and kept open the way to a friendly solution, Austria refused. On the other hand, the Emperor Francis Joseph expresses himself thus. The latest events prove incontestably that Prussia is now setting open force in the place of right. Thus has the most impious of wars, a war of Germans against Germans, become inevitable. The answer for all the misery it will bring on individuals, families, neighbors, and districts, I summon those who have brought it about before the judgment seat of history, and of the eternal and almighty God. The opposite party is always the one that wishes for war. The opposite party are always charged with setting up force in the place of right. Why then is it anyhow possible, consistently with public law, that this can happen? An impious war. Because it is one of Germans against Germans. Quite true. The point of view is a higher one. 
which beyond Prussia and Austria raises the wider conception of Germany. But take one step more, and we shall reach that still higher unity in the light of which every war, men against men, especially civilized men against civilized, will necessarily appear in impious fratricide, and to summon before the judgment seat of history. What is the use of that? History, as it has been managed hitherto, has never pronounced any other judgment than a worship of success. When anyone comes out of a war as conqueror, the guild of historic scribblers fall in the dust before him and praise him as the fulfiller of his mission of educative culture and before the judgment seat of Almighty God. Yes, but is not this he who is represented as the producer of the fights? Is not the same almighty irresistible will equally concerned with the outbreak as with the course of the war? Oh, contradiction on contradiction, and this is what must certainly take place always, whenever the truth is hidden under hypocritical phrases, when an attempt is made to hold equally holy two principles which are mutually destructive, such as war and justice, or national hatred and humanity, or the god of love and the god of battles. And Benedict says, we are standing opposed to a war power which is composed of two halves, line and landwehr. The first is formed exclusively of young fellows who are not accustomed either to fatigue or privation, who have never taken part in any considerable campaign. The second consists of untrustworthy, discontented elements, who would like better to overthrow their own government, which they disliked, than to have to fight us. The enemy has also, in consequence of the long period of peace, not a solitary general who has had the opportunity of educating himself on the field of battle. Veterans of Mincio and Palestro, you will, I think, count it as a special point of honor, acting under your old and tried leaders, not to yield to such antagonists even the smallest advantage. The enemy has for a long time been pluming himself upon his quick-firing needle-gun, but I think, my men, that will not do him much good. We shall most likely leave him no time for that, but charge him home at once, with a bayonet in the butt, as soon as, with God's help, the enemy has been beaten and compelled to retreat, we shall follow on his traces, and you will rest from your toils in the foeman's country and demand, in the amplest measure, those refreshments which a victorious army will have fully merited. Finally, Prince Frederick Charles says, Soldiers! The faith in covenant-breaking Austria has now for some time, without any declaration of war, disregarded the frontiers of Prussia in Upper Silesia, so I might have equally considered myself entitled to cross the Bohemian frontier without any declaration of war. But I have not done so. Today I have forwarded a regular declaration of war, and today we tread the territory of our enemies in order to protect our own country. May our commencement have God's sanction. Is this the same God with whose help Benedict promised to strike down the enemy? Let us rest our cause in his hands, who guides the heart of men, who decides the fate of nations and the result of battles, as it is written in the scriptures. Let your hearts beat for God, and your hands strike the foe. In this war, as you know, Prussia's dearest interests nay, the continued existence of our beloved Prussia, are in question. The enemy avows in the most open manner to wish to dismember and humiliate her. Shall then the rivers of blood which your fathers and mine poured out under Frederick the Great, and that which we lately poured out in Dupel and Alsen, have been poured out in vain? Never. We will maintain Prussia as she is, and make her stronger and more powerful by victory. We will show ourselves worthy of our fathers. We rely on the God of our fathers that he will be gracious to us, and bless the arms of Prussia. So now, forward with our old battle cry, with God, for king and fatherland. Long live the king. End of chapter 9 End of section 39.